Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I hope this episode finds you well. Let's work our way through the business side of the house first. This episode is brought to you by Feels. If you experience stress or you have anxiety, perhaps it's chronic pain, or maybe you have trouble sleeping at least once a week, you are not alone. Trust me, many of us do, to include myself. Enter Feels. What is it? It's a premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep. What does it do? Well, it naturally helps you reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. I personally have used it for all of those. It's very easy to take. This is a sublingual experience. You're going to put a few drops of feels under your tongue, and you're going to feel the difference within a few minutes. That's the thing to remember about CBD. Finding the right dose is important, and everyone's dose is different. And this is why I actually recommend their flight. It is three different vials of three different doses. You can experiment on your own. If you're new to CBD, they offer a CBD hotline, and uh, it has text message support to help guide you through that experience. It naturally works to help you feel better. There's no high, no hangover, and no addiction. And they also have a membership. You can join the Feels community to get the Feels delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order. Feels helps me feel great, and it can help you too. You can become a member today by going to feels.com slash cleared hot, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash cleared hot to become a member and get 50% automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by Magic Spoon. Hands down, the world's best snack food. At least, that is how I think about it. When I was growing up, I used to love cereal, probably because it was completely full of sugar. Because as I got older, I would eat that cereal, and, well, let's just say the old scale was ticking up pound by pound. And as I've gotten older, and I've been thinking more about my longevity and health, I have decided I need to really manage and cut down on the carbs, sugar, unhealthy food, and came to the realization I can't eat the way that I used to. But snacking still crushes me. And this is where Magic Spoon has made a huge impact in my daily life. There's no sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in each serving. There's a variety of flavors to choose from. My wheelhouse has been the cocoa, fruity, frosted, or blueberry. And I actually will mix them between. Tastes amazing. People ask me all the time. It's, it's, almost, it's too good to be true, I would say, almost. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. If you're interested, which I hope that you are, go to magicspoon.com slash cleared hot to grab a variety pack, and you can try all of those today. Be sure to use the promo code cleared hot. The way I'm looking at it is all one word, all uppercase, at checkout to get free shipping. They're so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason... They'll refund your money, no questions asked. Magicspoon.com slash cleared hot. Use the promo code cleared hot for free shipping. This episode is also brought to you by NetSuite. If you own a business, you don't need anybody telling you how difficult it can actually be. But you might be making it a little bit harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. It is time for you to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. You can ditch the spreadsheets and all of the old software that you've likely outgrown. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSuite is going to give you the visibility and control over your financials and HR and inventory and e-commerce and more. Everything you need all in one place instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let them uh, show you what they can do. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash cleared hot. And you can schedule your free product tour right now. netsuite.com slash cleared hot. Again, netsuite.com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by Honey. Let's get real for a sec. Let's get down to nuts and bolts. Between work, home, school, kids, relationships, everything going on in the world, we all collectively, we have enough on our plate to really think about. And that's why Honey is here to make at least one aspect of your life a lot less complicated. And that is saving money. Honey is a browser extension. And when you add it to your computer for free and shop on lots of your favorite websites like normal, 
If it finds a coupon, it will automatically tell you, and then you can apply the correct codes and drop the price in a flash. No thinking, no remembering, no searching. You just sit there and blissfully allow the automation to work. One of my favorite things about this, it doesn't sell your data. Having said that, it's already found over $1 billion in savings automatically. I used it this morning. I went to the website. I needed a GoPole, something you hold in your hand uh, underneath a GoPro, because I just picked up a GoPro 360. I went to the Best Buy website. I searched for it. It identified two coupons instantly without me doing anything. I applied one at checkout and saved about 10 bucks. It's literally a no-brainer. In just a few seconds, you could have one less thing to worry about. So what is it that you're waiting for? If you want to try it today at joinhoney.com, both of those words need to be in the website, J-O-I-N, honey.com slash cleared hot. That is joinhoney.com slash cleared hot. And they will simply walk you through the steps for fire and forget coupon shopping. Last but absolutely not least, this episode is brought to you by ButcherBox, and they have a pretty killer deal for you right now, the Game Day Bundle. New members are going to get St. Louis ribs, pulled pork, and a pack of bacon free in your first box, plus free shipping. What is ButcherBox? Well, it's a company that believes in high-quality meat, unbeatable value, flexibility, convenience, and decisions that actually make a difference. They believe in caring about animal welfare. They believe in supporting farmers and treating our fam- uh, planet, not family, planet, but also family, with respect. Better meals enjoyed together on the flexibility and convenience that suits your personal needs. I enjoy this service because one of the things I often run out of time to do, and by that I mean I forget to schedule time to do it, is to go to the grocery store. And for me, My easiest path towards success when it comes to health and wellness and a dietary perspective is planning ahead. So allowing these high-quality meats to land at my doorstep without thinking about anything allows me to meal plan for my week, for my day. It makes a huge difference in my life. Again, if you're interested, right now, the game day bundle, new members will get St. Louis ribs, pulled pork, and a pack of bacon free in your first box plus free shipping. Where do you go to get this done? Butcherbox.com slash cleared hot. That's right. Butcherbox.com slash cleared hot. You're going to need to enter your email to access this deal, but trust me, it's worth it. You're also going to get free shipping. Butcherbox.com slash cleared hot. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is Jason Tushin. And if you follow the podcast, I believe it was two full auto Fridays ago, we sat down together and answered some questions specifically about leadership. And on that topic, Jason is somebody in my military career that I would look to as a mentor when it came to leadership, both on the enlisted side of the house and also when I transo- transitioned over to becoming an officer. I mean, 27 years in you're going to know a thing or two. And about 10 of those years were at the apex of what's possible on the enlisted side of the house. The old E9, the master chief, master chef, if you will. I mean, I could say that. He wouldn't want to say that. He'd probably slap me if I said that. So he's not here. I'm going to say what I want to say. Wealth of knowledge and experience inside of the SEAL teams. He gets out. What does he do? He challenges himself. And so now he's working with and for two Two companies on the tech side of the house, Restore and Scilabs, and I'll put the links to both of those in the show notes. I'm not even going to attempt to describe what it is that he does or what they do, but it's an interesting study and practical exercise in taking leadership and applying it to a sector completely different than your knowledge wheelbase or wheelhouse, your expertise. And that is exactly how leadership should be. It should transcend business sector. And I'm going to shut up now. Because Jason and I talk about this quite a bit. Episode number 165 with Jason Tushin. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, one of them. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. I don't even know where to start this epic journey. Where should we begin? Right. I guess we could, I don't know, from the beginning. Well, first there was light, I think. I there read was a, light. I read a yeah. book one time where that was the beginning. Yeah. 28 years. 27. 
I was going to give you an extra. I knew it was 27. A little but was, over. Some change. At what point in time did it start getting old? <laughs> uh, <laughs> who's the current bullfrog before we begin? Oh, fuck. I don't know. It would be... Uh, Pull that thing closer to your face. Sorry. I'm not sure. That's right. Swing it. You can swing it to you also. That's I should lean in. Uh, I'm trying to think who it is. It, uh, it might be Steve Alias. So the bullfrog is the longest serving enlisted seal and it's always over 30 years right i think it's the longest serving seal but you, you almost have to have done no, you're not going to give that that officers are not in my mind no. officers are not eligible for the bullfrog because it was Olson, i thought for a while <sighs> and then it was uh i think right now it's steve alias he was 30 most, pl- 30 plus oh yeah way he was uh like he was e5 or e6 when i went through buds <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he might be creeping up on 40. Yeah, so there, yeah. is there actually, is there a plaque? Or yeah. is it just kind of this unofficial thing, like, hey, you are currently the longest serving? No, it's a plaque. It's like a, a frog with okay. names on it, I'm pretty sure. I have to imagine that they're tired of that shit at that point. I don't know, man. I think you hit a point, like, like I didn't get tired of it. Like, I wasn't- In 27 years, you weren't tired of it? No, because, you, uh, one, when you're younger, it's fun the whole time, right? And then you hit- Depending on when you serve, I would say. Yeah, that's true. I like I had fun up until I made E nine and then and then uh, which you did ten years before you got out <laughs> right and, and so like at that point there's like a period of mourning for yourself where you're like okay I'm not kicking indoors anymore and I'm like that guy and and so that that first year was hard like when I was w- working PTRR like, yeah this sucks you know I'm not gonna do anything fun and all the dudes are coming back from deployment and you're just like oh man and you're sitting there. <laughs> Working with bud students, PTRs uh, was it physical training, rest and recovery? Yeah, yeah, it was like pre. Yeah, it used pre- to be first. fourth phase, right? Right. And then okay. They, and then they, you know, did that and uh, you know revamped it a bit. And, and there was like a six month, eight month period there where I was like, oh man, I don't know. This Considering is... your life choices. Yeah, but then, <laughs> but then once you uh you you get into the the meat grinder, you know, every two years you're doing something different in, as a E nine. And and so yeah. that part was it was cool and, and once you like accept the fact you're not your former action guy, uh, then you kind of okay how do I lead the team better the team's better than when I got there and so every whatever role you get put into whether you like it or not you you really focus on trying to lead things better than when you got there. I would like to think that <clears throat> all of the E nines had that headspace. No, I'm going to say right now they absolutely didn't. No, um, because. The community is amazing, but it would be even more amazing if people. Here, here's a concept: realize you can't make E10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, totally. You've peaked out, and you do have an incredible amount of impact because the seats you were sitting in, or the meetings that you were then going to, or the information that you had access to. Yeah, you're not getting that shit when you're an E5. No, and God, you don't no. actually want it when you're an E5 because you would do nothing but be a monkey wrench in that wheel. Ignorance is bliss, man. Yeah, and it, that's true. And I think, but I think for the most part, most guys are really into it. Uh, want to make an impact i mean there's if you take the ego aside there's some guys that the ego was uh a bit much you see like i never had any aspirations to like oh i want to be force master chief or i want to be a group one mass chief it was just more like i'll send me where you want to go i would have actively avoided both of those jobs yeah i, I yeah only because well and you and i both know this because we may or may not have gotten in some trouble throughout our careers <laughs> You get to those seats, and we were talking this morning about how you got to, at some level, you're like, oh, my God, I'm now read in on all the bullshit that's oh, happening. Yeah. What is a Force Master Chief? I mean, they're doing quite a lot, but they're also sitting there dealing with discipline and alcohol-related incidents. Yeah. And spousal. It's like like we were saying, the SEAL teams are just it's a community of human beings, so you have yeah. human being problems. 100%. And that, to me, as the Force Master Chief or the Group One Master Chief, I bet you that occupies more of your time than you would like to think. Way more than you want it to. Yeah, <laughs> it sucks. You're like, and uh, you just kind of like some days you just like put your head down. You're like, oh my god, you know. Yeah. But you know, for me, it was uh, when I realized like it was time to get out. It wasn't that it was like I, I was counting stoplights on the way to work or anything. Like, oh, I can, I, you know, like it was hard to go to work. I, yeah. I still enjoyed going to work every day. I loved the people. Uh, some of the people, but I'm what, go on record and say I loved some of the people. Yeah, most I guess, and, and there's a handful that just <laughs> couldn't stand. It still wouldn't. And know. guess what? There's probably a handful of people. I could speak for myself. There's a handful of people who couldn't stand me. Oh, so, for sure. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, 
I certainly yeah. was probably like a nice 80 grit to some people and others. They were like, yeah, you're awesome. And that's, it, that's the way it is. They didn't appreciate your sarcasm <laughs> or your input. Yeah, you, don't, you didn't sugarcoat much. But uh, <sighs> what it was, was like nothing surprised me anymore, right? Yeah. So some, you know, you come in on a Monday morning or you get that call on a Sunday, you know, morning. Yeah. Or early. Yeah, the early calls. Yeah, like 2 in the morning. Like, you know. awesome. Oh, somebody wants to call and give me great news at 2 o'clock yeah, in the morning. Right. Cool. What happened? Oh, yeah. yeah. I just had the best day of my life, which ended up with me in jail. Right. Yeah, punching <laughs> out a cop and, you know, hijacking a golf cart at Kaboo or whatever. And, yeah. And, and so none of those things surprised me. And that started making me a little nervous in that, okay. Uh, you, and then you catch yourself getting complacent. Like, I, I liked, uh, you know, Coronado is like the most parking-constrained environment on Earth. I had a parking spot right up front, and yeah. I liked that. And by right up front, you're talking walking distance to the beach. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, and that's that's a dangerous place to be. So I, I, I was like, you know, two things really forced my hand. One was that I was too comfortable. I wanted to be uncomfortable again. And then two, uh, due to some, uh, you know, family stuff with wanting to take care of my uh you know, my wife wanted to be close to her parents because they're getting older and mm. and, uh, and and needed some help. That it would, I'd said no to going out to uh, Sock Pack to take that job, which would have been a dream location for you, given your love ass. for surfing. Yeah, yeah, no, it'd have been awesome. Yeah, let's just. Oh, you want to finish up in Hawaii? Uh, survey says yes. Check. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the kids would have loved that one, but they would have. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's. I never had that uh, criteria for myself that I would go until I said no to a job. It yeah. Would, for me, I was actually. For me, physically, I'm like, okay, my body's not going to be able to do this anymore. Yeah, you're and pretty then, tatered. I was, and then talking to, I won't say her name, but anybody who knows the officer detail of the world. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I called and I had gotten back off that deployment in 2010, and because I had not this, and this is the classic military, the people. Unless you've experienced this, this might not make sense. So I was functioning largely as an OIC of a platoon. Yeah. But on paper, I was like the junior assistant operations officer for Scott. That's right. And so when I, you know, they do the paperwork and you get your yearly fit rip on the officer side of the house or your eval on the enlisted side of the house, the little descriptor of your job position yeah. means a lot. Oh, totally. So mine did not say AOIC. Oh, I see. It's like junior assistant to the third, you yeah. know, clown show wrangler. So I call Margaret after that, you know, almost 10 months overseas and, hey, what does it look like next? Oh, well, let's see where you are. And, you know, you hear the little keys oh, and, God. well, you need to do your AOIC first and then yeah. you'll do your OIC back to back. Then we'll probably send you on a disassociated tour. And you, right. And I just was like, um, no. Yeah. No I'm not way. doing any of that. So. Yeah, I was going to get out, and then uh, I was just going to separate. I was just going to be done with the military at what would I had in I would have had fifteen years. Right, right. Go in to get my discharge paperwork, all the medical stuff done, and the and the doc. Yeah, I remember when you got commissioned. I was kind of like, wow. Now, were you an LDO? Or? I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you like we were joking about the other night. The first time I ever put on a set of khakis, I walked over to your <laughs> office. I was like, touche. Do I have this shit on right? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I should know. Well, you were over in there in your khakis more often than not. I did. I had to wear those over there. I didn't like that. Yeah. No, so it was different for me. I mean, it I, It was a, a combination of there was no way I was going to be able to do physically right. those things back to back. And I was given no other options. And so I just took door number three was, I guess I'll get out. I would have had no yeah. retirement. Obviously, the, the VA stuff. but Right. And then, yeah, added another year to get processed. Joe was awesome. He was the OIC yeah. of Trade Ed. And he was like, listen, man, just get your stuff done. Right. And then I remember, I was looking, I was like, God, how much terminal leave can I save up? Because I just don't want to come in anymore. And I was like 30 days short. Uh. And I walked into Joe's office and I was like, hey, I'm done coming to work. I don't feel like I want to <laughs> okay. do that anymore. And he was like, well, you know, the replacement's already here. He's like, hey, you know, check in over the phone yeah. or, or don't, you know, like, let's go play some golf every once in a while. And I was like, that's awesome. Joe's awesome. He was the best. Yeah, he's really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was surprised. Like, and, and, like the officer's it always pained me to see the the way things got detailed and and it was just it i, I thought there wasn't we, a lot of rhyme or reason to it there wasn't like a, that it, woman that one particular woman too much power oh my god yeah. wielded i would hear stories of people who would go to her office in dc and who knows whether or not the accuracy of this but you know sticky notes of you know keeping track of people and where they need to be oh yeah and it was from the admirals like when they went in there but it was from the admiral 
and the sticky note, you could follow them all the way back until it was an ensign. <laughs> you know, like the power of uh, like shaping yeah. and moving all that stuff. And yeah, you know, fuck, you get on the wrong side of that person. You're done. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it was crazy. How right? does seven years in Bahrain sound uh, unaccompanied? What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and it's, it's, it, it's unfortunate, you know. I mean, some people loved her, some people hated her, but... Way and too she much. loved some, and she hated some. Yeah, and, and it's like, okay, so, you know, send a box of chocolates, and you're going to get the orders you want. I mean, that, yeah. how wrong is that? So, so I, the, right after I got commissioned, this is another awesome Joe story. <laughs> um, it was like my first meeting as an officer, and they were getting together the warrants and LDOs on the West Coast. Yeah, and she was there, and Joe gets up to open the conference because it was it was kind of like we need to figure out what our role is in right. all this, and he drew up a like an old school recurve bow. And then he put a little arrow on it. And it was like, you know, the arrowhead. This is the, he, was, he started going through it. He's like, yeah. the arrowhead, this is the operational portion of the teams. And, you know, the, then there's the arrow shaft. And, the, you know, these are all the support networks and, like, the bow. You know, everything that makes it all possible and the bigger machine in the military. He's like, yeah. all of you in this room think we're the arrowhead. He's like, <laughs> let me just tell you, we're lucky to be, like, the leather wrapping on the handle. So change the way you think about shit. I was like, oh, my God. Wow, that's uh, sobering. Yeah, great. What I just get into? Uh, I mean. But it was good. People need that. Yeah. No, it's it, real. Uh, yeah. They didn't manage it well. Like, you know, somebody like you, right? They you, shut it down. The LDOs aren't even uh, yeah. allowed now in the in the it, teams. It's just, you know, it, it's they try to make a cookie cutter approach. You got to follow this progression. And, like, somebody like you or somebody has got, you know, more, uh, again, you know, more – a lot of tactical experience and, and really fantastic experience on the ground, whether, you know, in combat or jumping or whatever else. Like, hey, you're an officer, you know, unlimited, whatever you're, you can stay in as long as you want. Yeah. Why? And you're going to make rate your, your next oh, for pay sure. rate. At least the first two. Yeah. Up until lieutenant commander. Yeah. Uh, why not put you in a niche role where you can really get the most, make the most impact instead of trying to move guys around to, okay, you're going to do this tour, then your disassociated tour, yeah. then that. And then- I, I know what their answer was or would have been, well, that role doesn't exist, which is the easy button out. Yeah. Because what they should have done for the health of the community. They make it. Correct. Create the role. And not that I would have been the perfect fit for that. I could have, I mean, I definitely was jumping quite a bit and I enjoyed that aspect of it. But sure. I mean, there's, there's a, there's certainly an argument to be made. I couldn't believe I got picked up for LDO. It was. Yeah hilarious that's awesome i had to read the message like a couple times in the back of my head i'm like you guys sure you want to do this you sure you want to do this (laughs) yeah okay (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) they did make some changes though like with the like the and and i don't know you know i kind of got out when it was getting implemented so i don't know if what the status of it was but you know for guys to make 06 admiral you know it has to be you have to do the major command and yeah. and then it's you know they're gonna make one out of the six guys, uh, but they they were talking about making another progression which was gonna be more in the logistics and acquisitions and the you know interesting nav realm because there's guys who are really good at it but then they plateau and you know having and some of those guys need to plateau oh for sure because there's a glass ceiling I don't care yeah. what your color device is there's a glass ceiling that you will eventually hit at some point yeah absolutely and some people are great and would be a great admiral. I mean, my opinion from my understanding and, well, shit, and the seats that you used to sit at, it's hard to, under, I guess, to describe the the sphere that an E9 would be in. So I got out as an O3E. Like, yeah. The meetings that I would sit in are different than the meetings. That, oh, totally. Yeah, you are you were talking, well, not talking, but you were exposed to probably the deepest inner workings, the not the conceptual, but just the mechanisms of how all that shit actually works together. Yeah. Whereas me, I understood the operational Right element and how that works overseas. Oh yeah, you're totally peeking behind the curtain of Oz. Yeah, up there and you're. That's was there you're, a donkey with a? Uh, there was, yeah, 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 little fly flying around its ears. Completely, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, you'd sit, we'd have the uh, like every week we'd be with the admiral and be all the magcoms and uh, the CNCs. major commands. Yeah, major commands, yep. all the groups and and, and Damnak and whatnot, uh, and then the CMCs and then uh, you know for most of my time uh, ops and then for Group One uh, it was Brian Losey, and he would. You know, go around the horn, and it was funny to watch the dynamic though. When, uh, like, he was ruthless on the uh, on the O sixes, you know. And I mean, I, I still got an O six is a captain yeah. for people listening. And in my opinion, the jump from captain to admiral 
It's kind of similar in the jump between E6 to E7, but we're talking yeah. a magnitude of order greater. Oh, yeah, insane. So you get a star on your shoulder board, and you'll never be told the truth again. Nope. <laughs> yeah, and you, and, but you become an ensign one star, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're just kind of like a, you're a baby admiral, it seems like, at those points. But, yeah, and I still, like, he would he was hard on the 06, and, you know, rightly so. But he Few would, people are hard on 06s, because yeah. few people can be. yeah. But he was, he was like, I really, like, I learned a ton from him. I mean, I still got, he wired brushed me a few times too, so I still got some scars from it. But I, I earned it, you know? And, but he would listen, like, if, if you know, I spoke or, or Kinger or, yeah. or Wally or somebody spoke up, uh, he would, he would, you know, really take it on board. Well, he should, because you're talking over 20 years of experience. Yeah. Actually, I wonder, so in 06... That's probably about the same amount of time. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, Gary and I, we, we were a tag team for about four years together. Okay. And, right. uh, you know, yeah, he so and those I had people the same need amount. to listen. The amount, yeah. the, 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 gen, the hundreds of years worth of experience sitting in a table like that. Right. Yeah, the smart leader sits there and asks questions and actually listens. Oh, totally. And, you know, it, it carries a lot more weight if you don't talk all the freaking time, too. Like, yeah. you'd be judicious when you pipe up, you know, okay, this, like, something will come up and say, oh, okay, I, you know, I'm obligated to really address this because this is a burn in my ass. Jocko talks about that a lot, actually yeah. saving that equity. You know, guys yeah. will be, our Wi-Fi is not fast enough. He's like, yeah, I got it. It says nothing, you know. Right. Our, Why isn't there more Dasani water in our refrigerator? Like, got it. And yeah. then something actually comes up and he goes and puts forward the argument. Totally. Not everything should be a Civil War trench warfare, people. That, you really see that with uh, when guys first make chief. Because they're like, hey, man, you know, everybody, they, they go on their charge book and like, look out for your men, look out for your sailors. And, okay, cool, that's, that's you should, but yeah. that doesn't mean, you know, it's what they require, not what they desire. And the, people, especially new That'd leaders. That'd be a good tattoo for like a forehead. Yeah. <laughs> it would, I, well, I felt like tattooing on a few people who would come in my office yeah. for, hey, we need to do this. It's like, I, I honestly don't give a shit about pants right now, Yeah, you know. What I care about is that we got enough money to fund training. Because so, you have pants. Right. You don't like the pants that you have. Yeah, and they might suck, and we'll yeah. get to them at some point. And thanks for bringing it to our attention. But, like, that's not that's not an issue I'm going to go fall on a sword for. Yeah, don't let it hit you in the ass on the way out. Right. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. No, nah, and, and guys would just – they'd miss that point a lot. And then, they, you, you know, learn over time. Especially yeah. – I mean, usually it takes you, like, you're getting your ass chewed once by the mass chief go – don't ever come and talk to me about something that stupid again. Well, then I am a slow learner based off my own personal experience sure. of having my ass chewed by Master Chiefs. Yeah, comes with the territory. I feel like it would happen once a fiscal year for me, generally. Or mainly at Damnak or, or No, it never really stopped. Um, I Jock, When I was on Jocko's podcast, he asked me what rank I got in the most trouble at. And I was thinking, I was like, well... Probably equally at all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I Fuck, can see that. man. I, God. But it was younger. It was just different. I would just get taped up and shoved in a footlocker for hours. Hours. Yeah. Or happy had it or oh, yeah. that type of stuff. Um, which those were the. But we didn't haze. <laughs> well, here's the thing I was a better person for it. I understood totally. why they were doing it. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't a lick of malicious intent. There were ass. Hazing has its place, and I don't care if people agree with me or disagree with me. It depends on the intent behind it. Totally. If you're hazing to be a dick and to hurt somebody, go fuck yourself. You're doing it wrong. Yeah. But it can be the glue that actually binds people together. I remember my first platoon. The uh, first time the old Happy Hats came out, we were in Nyland, which is the of desert course. training facility. For like four weeks, you're out there, and you're just yep. moving your feet, one in front of the other, <laughs> through the desert at nighttime. And this is like, we didn't even have nods. This is the no. 90s. Like, the pyramid rocks everywhere. Oh, everything. And sometimes the training cadre would come out and shoot pop flares, and you'd just like, it was so stupid. Hit the deck. <laughs> we would hit the deck. And one of the nights, um, of course, uh, alcohol was involved. And one of the nights, the older guys, I remember they came in, we were like watching TV, and they grabbed one of the other new guys. And I, I remember my first thought was, Man, I'm going to be so bummed out if they don't do the same thing to me. Because it would have yeah. been an indication that they, don't they like didn't you. like me. Right. And so I had no issue with it whatsoever. None. Because there was no malicious intent. DQ is the OIC. Ah, uh, <laughs> he got a few too. He did. And I'm pretty sure he was like issuing rigorous tape to people that night. <laughs> a real separation of church and stay there. He's just man. like, Shh. I just reconnected with him at Dave's funeral. It was awesome to see him again. Yeah, he's a stud. But yeah, I mean, there's a time and place for it. It's, uh, I hope they don't comp I would have bet well you would probably know this again given the policy and the doctrine you got to see inside of 
I would bet it is expressly, at least on paper, oh, forbidden okay. in the community. Oh, isn't it? Yeah, completely. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you're spot on. Was it was it expressly prohibited when we were in, and they were doing it to us, or did that change later too? I mean, I think it was prohibited. But it was not at a doctrinal it, level. Yeah, I, uh, it might have been, but nobody, you know, it's just a different time, right? Yeah. And uh, nowadays, with social media and guys looking, you know, there, there's more attention on us, and so you have to be completely above board. I mean, I, I the the concept behind it, I, I, I'm with you. Like, if you yeah. didn't, if you didn't get it, you felt like, okay, something's really bad. Like, they don't like. You felt me. left out. Right, which is the exact opposite you want to feel of a team of sixteen people, and you're the only one sitting there, like, okay, well, I guess I'll go inventory the nachos, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you're the black sheep, you know, yeah. nobody wants you around, then. Yeah, uh, and I think it. Uh, it I understand why you, you can't do it, and the concerns, particularly in this day and age, uh, and with all the, we're under a microscope constantly, so you got to be above board. I do think, though, uh, you know, if you have a choice between taking a guy's trident. And he's worked all his hard, and he, he years you know, of work. Yeah, and has a titanic fuck up, and you're just gonna end his career and really throw a wrench and curveball in his life. Or, you know, I rather if if I was a guy who made that screw up, I would rather just get tuned up behind the mill vans, take my licks, and learn from it that way, and move on with life, and move on with life, and yeah. learn that way. And uh, so we've had to, you know, the community's had to evolve though with that, and that's why you see more things like guys getting, you know, disciplinary review boards and. You know, you did you see an increase in that towards because I was out in 13, so you had five more years active, yeah, than I did. How oh. many guys would you say? I've always, and this is kind of like anecdotal just based on what I saw, but I'd say per workup at a team, you're pulling at least one dude's trident, yeah, generally. I mean, it's probably it might be about that. I, I, I can't really remember the numbers, uh, yeah, that's probably about accurate. I think it when I was at team one, we had a couple. Wow. Those are some of the hardest boards I sat in on. Horrible. And uh, I didn't sit, sit in on them until I had um, switched over to being an LDO. And yeah. I actually specifically until my last tour over at Trade It, I think we pulled two or three. Yeah. Sitting in those boards and, and coming to that decision, and you know, because obviously the person comes in and it's not a, not a glorious experience for them either. I mm -hmm. mean, they're certainly facing the firing squad metaphorically and literally to some degree when it comes to a verbal perspective. But... Tough decisions, man. Yeah. And it was, the decision was easier if it was. Uh, Criminal behavior, that one wasn't easy. Like, yeah. you cannot transport and sell government firearms. You shouldn't, you know. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> like but, that one is like, I actually really don't care what you say, like how hard your life is. You're a moron. Yeah. If it's ethical, you're out. If it's, yeah. you know, completely going against the ethos and, and yeah. just, I mean, even just common sense ethics, you know, uh, no, no issues there. It was when they were. Just shitty operators. Like which they is just hard. couldn't get it. Yeah. Like they, they were trying. Yeah. It's the good dude theory. <clears throat> yep. People will ask me all the time, well, you know, it, it usually is framed in the question about diversity in the SEAL teams. Yeah. Well, if you guys let people more more people through, wouldn't you you'd have more diverse and you know, how many good guys are being lost in the training? My answer is a ton. Yeah. But we're not looking for good guys. Yeah. If I wanted to go and get a platoon of good guys, we could literally go to downtown Kalispell and like spend yeah. a day like hey dude what's up and getting to know people like this guy's a good dude come with me right that doesn't mean that no. you're that's no not i mean every kid for. that shows up at yeah. buds for the they're most awesome. part is you know they're young and they're fired up and they're patriotic and like uh herbert captain herbert when he was running buds he's like look man he's like these guys all showed up here knowing they're going to take a four by four across the chicklets in wartime yeah in war and they're signing up in wartime to go to the unit a unit that you know is going to go yep. get after it uh, you have to respect that completely. And I, I, I worked with some instructors who I, I mean, I can't speak for them, but I feel like they didn't respect that totally. And I came to the realization early on that if I was going to stay in the Navy, cause I got to buds as an E six yep. and I picked up my commission there, but if I was going to stay in the Navy, I was going to have to work with these people. So instead of yeah. just being an asshole with a hammer and a chisel or a guillotine, why not sit there and like build them up totally. and start teaching them? And, and it, and don't get me wrong, you have to earn that. Like yeah. they need to make it and perform, and you know. But like after pool comp, your odds of becoming a team guy are in like the high ninetieth percentile. Right? Why can't you start treating them like a young junior operator and communicate with them that way? Answer their questions, 
and build the force that you want to have sure. as opposed to being this chip on the shoulder asshole instructor which by the way students have a great memory oh co- totally and you will get your fucking teeth cold cocked out in a bar yeah for something that you said and don't remember 100 <laughs> percent. and and, each, and the phases are different like we're second phase that's the way it, it really should have been with you guys you yeah. know and first I, phase I, is a different story you guys it, it was is. a meat grinder by design oh completely and yeah. but that doesn't mean a kid quits it doesn't mean he's a shit bag right it just means, you know, like I used to talk to every kid that quit. And more often than not, it was, uh, you, know, you want to be cool with them, right? They're, they're, they're good people. They showed up. They're already at the lowest point of their life. You really don't need to pile on that. Yeah, it's not like, yeah. you know, check your ego, man. And so we, uh, I talked to him all and like, hey, what's up? And he's like, look, you know, six months ago, I was living at home with mom going to high school. And now, I, like, I'm thrown into this. I'm just not mentally ready. I'm like, okay, cool. Or some people go, uh, this is just not for me. Right on, go do great things. And yep. I think for me, that tone was set uh, in my buds class. So uh, went through first, second, and most of the third phase with 178. 178, we had one officer. It was John Burnham. And uh, and he went through how we at the broken foot. So we knew he was going to get rolled right after. And so because of that, you know, we just got, we were fucked up. You know, we were late for everything. And my buds class did not get, uh, you know, the beginning of our hell week. They did. Yeah. It was silent. <laughs> they didn't even waste a single blank sixty really? round on break on breakout. Why not? Because they hated our class. Oh, that's awesome. That's funny. <laughs> that's like that's that, that goes back to not getting hazed. You're like, oh, okay. We're, we were, we're out doomed. the tents on the beach. Yeah. And you know, you go. Uh, so sun, hell week starts on a Sunday. It ends on a Friday. You're gonna get a couple hours of sleep on Wednesday. That's about it. And they put you out in these World War Two, yeah, potentially World War One era tents, and they haven't been washed. They haven't been washed. Smell like it. And you have a cot, and you're out on the beach, right next to the water. And traditionally, you just go to uh, YouTube and put, you know, Bud's Hell Week breakout, and it's gonna, it's a simulated firefight. Essentially, it's cool as hell. Yeah, smoke and explosions and blanks, and we're sitting out there, and you just hear a guy go, "Hit the surf," huh? And then all the thing that happened was some dude pulled open the tent and was looking. <laughs> the instructor staff was out there. There was three tents, and I was like in the far one. And it's like, hit the fucking surf. And like the first tent came out. Yeah. But the second tent, just people were cold. just still looking. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, and then the, finally the instructors came up. And I remember for like the first hours, like, are, are we going now? Is like, is it? the clock ticking? Yeah. What is this? <laughs> that sucks. It, well, it was weird because yeah. you were preparing for one thing, yeah. and it was like this really slow roll. And, of course, the first thing we did, yeah. link arms. Yep. Forward march. March. And you know what was crazy is we had a rollback in my class who, you know, how a rollback positions their experience oh, yeah. and how the rollback's actual experience was, they can be very different. So he talked a really big game about, you know, you need to do this and this to make it through. He was the first dude to quit. quit. Oh, totally. And it began a cycle because people looked at him, they're like, oh shit, if this dude is, I mean, I'm talking within, I think, an hour. Yeah. Gone. Totally. Ding, ding, ding. And then another dude, ding, ding, ding. Floodgates. And I think it actually freaked the instructors out because they switched the evolution and we got, yeah, you know, we got the boats on our head and went down and did uh, where you paddle the boats in at the Hotel Del. Uh, Rock Portage. Portage. Yeah, Rock Portage. But- crazy the impact that one person had because he had talked such a game and totally. then when he bailed yeah it was like holy shit well, i totally remember guys like that you know just the usually the biggest shit talkers and like <laughs> you know the i was a you know division one swimmer yeah like okay and they quit like it's cool on a run probably if yeah, they were it, a swimmer and it, that's the beauty of buds though is that oh, it'll get you either one it's going to find your achilles heel yeah so something in in the course of that uh 26 weeks is you're going to find your weakness i thought like like for me, uh, Hell Week was, uh, it sucked, but it wasn't like, it didn't, I didn't entertain the idea of quitting. It, it wasn't like never hit a wall on it. Yeah. And we had, it was fucking, ours was fucked up. We had, uh, every time to put somebody, like a petty officer in our boat crew, they quit. And so they just left us as a five man boat crew for like from Tuesday night to Friday, which. That actually could be a huge advantage. It sucked, but it, no, it was horrible. I mean, my head was just like, I did my hair didn't grow back for six months, man. It was yeah. smooth as a baby's ass, and and uh, but it did it did end up working out in the long run in that or during Hell Week in that we never won an evolution, but we got like third or second, 
And so they're like, fuck, that's cool. You guys are, you know, understaffed. Yeah. So you guys can understaffed but overperforming. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so one and that goes back to the story about, you know, being cool with people. Uh one of the guys in my bow crew who was in his hard as woodpecker lips when it came to, you know, just mental toughness, uh we started pool, uh pool week. Mm-hmm. And in the very first evolution, you're sitting in like three feet of water, breathing on the regulator. He took two breaths. He stood up. He's like, I quit. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? He's like, I Oh, and for people listening, there's no taking that shit back. No. I'm like, <laughs> There's dude, no take backs. <laughs> you know, uh, what? You're trying to grab me. He's like, I do not like being underwater. I'm like. Did he have any idea of the occupation he was uh, I don't in think, training for? I don't think he ever knew until he did it <laughs> that it sucked. I mean, he passed like the knot tying, but the, yeah. the breathing. That's a breath hold, though. It is, and the, the, it was just claustrophobia, and it Fuck. freaked him. I'm like, and you know what? It's like, wow, he's a great dude, and he's hard as hell. Yeah. And, you know, he made it through Hell Week with flying colors. I mean, he, you know, he kept me going. There's and, something for everybody there. Totally. Pool comp was an interesting yeah. window into people's ability to deal with stress. I fucking hated it. I hated it, too. I yeah. passed it on my third attempt, which is Same. about normal. Um, yeah. And you get four, for people who don't know about pool comp, I think it was the... I want to say the fourth week of second phase, maybe, because we still had to do closed circuit diving after that. Third. Is it the third week? Yeah. Yeah, you would know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure third. You, pro- I wouldn't surprise me if you knew more about the job I was doing than I did, because I really didn't pay attention. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, what I'm saying, you were like, you had insight into deeper stuff. I would just yeah. go in and be like, "What week are we on, sweet?" and look at the board. Yeah, yeah. But you know, so it starts off, and it's it's another thing I think might be a misunderstanding is it's not a, buds is not a shotgun blast to your face. It's mm-hmm. very incremental. Yeah. You know, even in, well, first phase, I guess, would be a little bit more because, I mean, what are you teaching them to do? Flutter kicks properly? And yeah, but you still are done training at like five o'clock at night. Yeah. You got time to lick your wounds. But in, in second phase, which is the diving phase, if you pass pool week, you have a very, very good chance of being a yeah. SEAL. And the last test pool comp is rough. You're underwater. It's, it's a one to one ratio. It on paper can last up to 20 minutes. Let's just say that deviates wildly depending on who's holding the stopwatch. Right. But sometimes. Oh, I forgot to hit start. Mm, eh, my bad. bad. And uh, you're going to have problems introduced. You're going to have your ability to b- breathe when you want to interrupted. You're going to have your stuff ripped off of you. And it's all in control of somebody else. And basically, as an instructor, all you're watching for is whether or not they can follow procedures. Totally. And it starts with, is the regulator in your mouth or is it out of your mouth? But it's not... We graduate people into that. It's yeah. first day, you're sitting down there. Yeah, you're breathing. Then right. buddy breathing. Yep. Then... You do everything with a mask you can see through. So gear exchange or sure. ditch and dawn. And then you do the blacked out mask. And then finally we do that test. If we wanted everybody to fail, we would just do that test first. Right. So even in BUDS where people think like it's impossible to pass, we're still structuring it so the students can be successful if they follow the correct procedure. A hundred percent. There's like no greater uh, way to induce fear than not being able to breathe. You know, I mean, and I, yeah. and I catch it like surfing, you know, I get, yeah. get held on or one and like the water is a great equalizer. It is. It, but and, and like, I, I, that's why I loved. I mean, I hated pool week. It was the hardest week of my life, you know, and uh, but it, so many fantastic like lessons learned for myself on it. Like what really got me was uh, the gear exchange and huh. and and it was the, the we passed it the second time. But the first one day or night, it was it was uh night and it wasn't what happened was the regulator we had was leaking <laughs> and so every time i took a breath Get i was inhaling h2o yeah i was getting water in and it freaked me the fuck out and it that was the only time during buds i'm like fuck this like this is terrifying yeah and then i, I thank god my um uh, my swim buddy uh sean brooks uh passed away unfortunately but uh he he walked me off the X. You know, I wasn't going to quit, but like I was like. You were having an emotional moment. I was having a, a spiritual <laughs> Hiroshima, man. And uh, and then, you know what I did though? Then we we he, we spent like two hours just dirt diving it. Yep. And then it was smooth as glass. And then, so that, that re-energized my confidence. And then pool comp, the first one I thought I did pretty good. Uh, but, I, you know, they gigged me on something just to make me do it again. I thought I had passed and they pulled me up. And, you know, the instructor's like, how do you think it went? I was like, good, pretty sweet. Mind you, I still have my tanks on my back, which should have been the indicator that it didn't go so <laughs> sweet because you're supposed to come up on a free swimmer ascent with your shit still on the bottom of the pool. Nice and neat, yeah. And he's just like, no. And then just gave me the litany of shit that I had failed. 
Which, and I completely imploded on my second test because I was only thinking about the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Sleepless night that night. Oh, fuck yeah, man. Because you have two more attempts at it on Friday, and if you don't do that, you're getting a performance yeah. roll or a performance drop. Oh, dude, I know. We did it, uh, ours was Friday, so the first one I thought went well, but they, I failed something. The second one, god damn it, like, I picked the, the regulator I got had a wing nut on the back of the thing, like, this big. It's the only one in, and I'm like, I didn't even think about it. And so I have this, uh, it was an Army dude, SF guy, uh, E7, Sergeant First Class. And uh, he, you know, and I'm, I'm going through the procedures and, and I'm, I'm doing okay. And he, you know, he hits me and ties stuff in a knot and puts that mouthpiece over the wing nut. And I'm like, fuck, this is the whammy. <laughs> and so, like, I go, and he's like, you know, I'm asking for the, and he's like, and, uh, he gave you the wave off? Yeah, he's like, no. Awesome. And I'm like, fuck, I'm, okay, I need to come up. So I kiss the bottom and come up. And, yep. like, and he's like, Phil, he couldn't get the thing off on the pool deck. He broke the regulator trying to get off. I'm like, what? Yeah. And so That's not confidence inspiring. Yeah. No, nah, but then the third time, I, you know, it was full benefit, full time underwater. Same here. And, and it, I, all I focused on was the procedures. And yeah. to be honest, it, I know I was under for almost 20, but it could have it could have been five. Yeah. Because I, sh- sh- I was like- You're in the zone, man. Well, and I went into the headspace of- Fuck it. I'm going to die on the bottom of this pool. Yeah. But I'm not going to die by doing something wrong. Right. I am going to follow the procedure and I will either die or not die. Yeah. That, that's why that evolution is <laughs> so fantastic, though, because that's that's what your mindset yeah. has to be. And you have these, okay, you, you inject fear and panic. And how do you control your fear? How do you control your emotions and follow what are relatively simple procedures? But they, they couldn't be more simple. Yeah. In a context of you and I talking about it with right. the ability to breathe whenever we yeah. want to, not being underwater. But when you're like a minute into a <laughs> breath hold and you're trying to remember like, hey, my belt goes off this way. Yeah, and you're going, because <laughs> you're, yeah. And it's funny, those students, by the time they got to pool comp, could probably hold their breath oh, yeah. for three minutes. But not in that test. You're lucky. Well, I mean, actually I had some students who would hold their breath longer than me. It would piss me off because I was I would tie the whammy, <laughs> yeah. take a big breath, and go down and be waiting for them to give the and FSA. Like, and then I started being like, <clears throat> like motherfucker, now I got to go to the surface and come back down and get your dumb ass. Uh, there's a few like that. Yeah. Just genetic mutants. No, it was, what a great test. That water, but it's the test is about, it's the water that makes that test so hard mm-hmm. because it restricts that ability to breathe. And then I had to give the brief after pool comp. I was like, okay, gentlemen, yeah, you are not expert divers. No. For clarity, you know nothing about diving. Right. Do not go try to get your patty cert and do a wreck dive with your buddy where you think it's now a good idea to fuck with their gear. Yeah. Because that's what I would have thought. I'm like, totally. Yeah. And you'll die. So yeah. you know nothing about diving. We are now going to begin to teach you closed circuit. And right. at the end of this phase, you will be barely proficient. Yeah. No, to right. have that recalibration. Yeah. That, yeah. Those night dives. I mean, the second phase sucked, man. Like, first phase was bad, it was horrible. But like in a different it, in a different way. Yeah, it's just physical abuse, you know. Yeah. It's just how mentally tough you are. I think second phase, you know, one we didn't have any officers, like I said, because Burnham rolled and they rolled the guy in, he quit the next day, and so like, oh, we're gonna make this the best class ever. <laughs> and so it was just like, yeah, all the enlisted instructors were probably like, fuck yeah, we, we don't went need through these all the E sixes, but one <laughs> got down to the last two E fives. I mean, we just like literally we'd run from Chow straight to the ocean. Jump in, get wet and sandy, and just start the day. And it was just, yeah, just get it done first. Yeah, and you remember uh, Senior Chief McCarthy, the Antichrist? Yes, yes I do. That's yeah, the he, actual name that he was referred to as yeah. for us, too. Yeah, the Antichrist. He took over as uh, our proctor right after pool comp. And uh, Jesus Christ, man, that afternoon he took over. All It was the, the worst beating I've ever got. It was fun, though, because it was like, you can't hurt me anymore, but it was horrible. The single worst beating I ever got in Buds was one of my first few days there, and it was from Mike Mayer. <laughs> oh, he's a dick, man. He's awesome. <laughs> his jaw was wired shut. His daughter was like hop skipping and around around the street. It was like a Saturday. He fucked us up. <laughs> Two guys. We were over at uh, 618. Awesome. I don't know why I was even over at 618, which is a post-Hell Week uh, barracks, or it was, because I guess they're moving the whole training down the strand yeah but oh yeah yeah i don't know why as a white shirt who hadn't even started maybe we had just classed up but for whatever reason yeah mike mayor was kicking the shit out of our entire class at 618 awesome two dudes got up and ran to the compound looking for the bell <laughs> and he's just like get your fucking ass and they just ran they just fully 
committed to getting up and getting That's the fuck awesome. out. <laughs> Mike's a hard dude, man. Like you don't Mike wanna... is a very hard dude. Then he ended up being my first platoon chief. Really? For a little bit. On and Team 5, eh? At Team 5, but yeah. he wasn't able... I forget what was going on. It might have been uh, something family-wise. He yeah. was not able to do the platoon. So a guy rolled in yeah. to be my platoon chief was the dude who had passed me at pool comp. Oh, really? So it's... it's yeah, it yeah. was very interesting to see it interweaving back in. Yeah, it's cool when you... Uh... Yeah, I remember... Uh... It's cool, like when you you get out of buds and then you, the instructors, the guys you liked that were instructors that you yep. respected come back in. And, and oh, I wasn't. Let me tell you right now, I was not stoked to have Mike as my platoon chief because the no. only thing I could think of was, does he remember me from that day? Like, are you still pissed at me? And the reality is, he probably wasn't even pissed at us at all. It's like not even a blip on his right. radar. Yeah, but I'm scarred for the rest of my life oh, totally. for the number of monkey fuckers he made us do. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was. Yeah, or smurf guys. jacks or jumping lunges. It was just, I, I got out of bed the next day and fell down because my legs <laughs> were just detonated. It was a, what day was that? A Saturday or is it? It was a Saturday. Yeah, it sucks because now you're like, you're, you're behind the power oh, curve for Monday. It's God. Yeah. It, it was the worst. Yeah. He, and then I saw him as the platoon chief. I was just like, I might have made a bad choice in my life. Yeah, oh boy. <laughs> he's he, cool. And he was awesome. He yeah, was he's great. a rad dude. He helped me with, uh, it just like, he, I, I bumped into him at uh, Balboa you know a year before i was getting out and it it was like he just gave me all the do this don't do that you know yeah. good all the guidance spirit. yeah it was really cool when you i actually spent a good amount of time talking to the students who had quit as well yeah because i was fascinated as to why because yeah. you know as going through as a as a student if somebody quits like i never i don't know if i've ever run into anybody who was in my class that quit they mm -hmm. just it's like poof yeah they're gone they're gone yep and i never understood why because yeah. I, I agree with you, my headspace the whole time was I knew that I was volunteering to eat this yeah. foot-long shit sandwich. Yep. I was prepared to do so, wasn't considering quitting. Hell Week did suck. There's highs and lows, and everybody you know has good moments and bad. Yeah. But when I went back as an instructor, I, get to, I mean, sometimes, I don't know what this says about me, sometimes I would mess <laughs> with them after they had just quit. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more often than not, though, I... I I realized that they were in their shittiest moment, so I didn't necessarily want to pile on to them. Yeah. But I would ask, you know, what was it? And uh, I, there was one common theme or narrative that they gave me as to the reason why they gave up. But before I tell you what it is, I'm curious if you had a narrative or theme that they would tell you. I think, uh, you know, mine was mainly from in first phase. So they generally, to me, was a maturity issue. Uh, like, just not... The common, the common theme I got from them was they just weren't mentally prepared for it. They didn't. They probably thought they were though. I mean, they knew what they were getting into. Yeah, but it's I don't not think, like you wake up and you're at a buds. But you can read about it yeah. and go, okay, I can do that. And then you actually experience it, and you're like, holy shit, this yeah. sucks. And there's, you know, it, it it's easy to uh, get in the mindset that this is never going to end. And that ties in pretty close to what they would tell me: the mindset of it's never going to end. Yeah. The theme that they would, if I could get them to dial down to something precise, they would say they got overwhelmed. Yeah. They just totally. didn't think they could keep going for another 152 days or 145 days. Yeah. All, and so all they could think about was how far they were from the completion of their goal. Yeah. And as you know, that training is designed to suppress yeah. the human spirit. Oh, you can't think that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have to think it like- If you do think that way, you're done. You're Foxville. It's overwhelming. Yeah. You're completely overwhelming. You have to finish go. Finish day one, you're like, 179 more. Yeah, and it's <laughs> like, you just got to finish this evolution, and then, yeah. okay, we're going to go get lunch. Yeah. Cool. And then, and just take it that way, and it, you know. So it was overwhelming, and then I tell you what, even in those moments, short, in the 24 to 48 to 72 hours after they had made that decision, re <clears throat> regret. A lot of them regretted totally. the decision already. Because they made that decision in that place where their spirit was just being smashed and made an emotional decision yeah you know and that's the point of the training yeah and uh I, i've actually i've run into i ran into a student that quit when i was doing some of my va uh in san diego and i didn't remember him because as a student yeah. as a student you see 20 instructors as an right. instructor you see thousands of students yeah. um but he had he had quit in hell week and i was on shift it was a night shift and we had, we, and we had a great conversation, and I was asking him what he was up to, and like before it ended, his thing was, he's like, you know what? I still kick myself every single day. Of course. That you know, regret is not short-lived. Yeah. It gets, I mean. That was in the back of my mind, like, okay, you know, if if you quit, you're going to regret it forever. Yeah. Like, I would never let and that And they do. One. Yeah. I would never live that down. Yeah. For me. I know, it's just the way, I, I know the way I'm wired. I was a little bit, like, I was, when I went through Buds, I was 21, and so- 
Which is actually, that was older than most people in my class. Oh, yeah. I was, you know, we had, I mean, guys from the fleet. There's a lot more fleet transfers. So we had that. And those guys did okay. Some of them. Yeah. Some of them just imploded. It was like there was no gray area with them. It was either <laughs> kick ass or horrible. Yeah. But uh, for me, it was like, you know, I'd done enough dumb shit and, and been on my own long enough that the maturity really helped. You know, and I think. The life experience actually helps, too. Completely. Well, because it can help you buttress that poor emotional decision because if you've had shitty experiences and you've yeah. made the mistakes in your life and you've had those poor choices and suffered the consequences, yeah, yeah it's easier than being 19 out there your first time and like, well, yeah, here we go. I'm going to make yeah. this one on the fly. No, right. I mean, when like, uh, you know, the second I turned 18, I moved out, got an apartment in a shitty part of town and with three other dudes and, you know, had to work every day to pay rent. And, uh, and you know, and and you got to deal with those kind of hardships, and then, uh, and but you're used to adversity. You're used yep. to because uh, you've experienced it. Yeah, and then the other thing too, I think, is uh, you know, I just kind of question everything I was told. I still do, actually, a little bit of a rebellious streak in that aspect. And so, like, I knew the like, and because I questioned everything, I, I kind of looked at like just even Navy boot camp, and then Bud's like. Okay, the end state is something I want to achieve. I know they're going to be fucking with me the entire time, and and I but I know the reasoning why. But like, there's there's a reason for it, and I might not be crystal clear in the reason, but I'll, I accept that. Okay, this is the price of admission, and okay, I'm willing to just endure the abuse of it to yep. get to the goal I want. Like you said, it's the price of admission. Yeah, and what led you to the Navy in the first place? <laughs> uh, so, well, actually, you grew up not near the ocean. No, well, I You're grew up near me, water, but not near the ocean. Yeah, I was near Lake Michigan. Yeah, but uh, and I swam my whole life. But uh, originally, uh, I was in high school. I was a bit of a rebel, if you will, you know, the punker scene in a punk band. <laughs> you know, you were in a punk band. Oh yeah. yeah. What was your role in the band? I played guitar. Yeah, I got a good photo of it too. Actually, <laughs> we uh. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna need to send that to me so I can use it for the podcast. Oh, it's funny, man. The uh, and uh, and so I was like, I'm not going. You know, fuck college. I'm not going to do this. And some guy, but I did always have like think I was going to join the military at some point for some. You know, I just felt based on a like a family legacy or no patriotism. Okay, like I, I like uh. Like I love the Constitution, man. I love free speech. I love. It's uh, not a shitty document. It's no. It's. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you if you take out a couple egregious fuck ups when it was made, yeah. In terms of you know the three fifths compromise and whatnot, if which is, you know, it's horrible. Yeah. But other than that, it's a pretty good document. And I grew up in the Cold War. You know, like hating the Soviets and and the U.S. hockey team. You know, in 1980, which is like rad as hell. And oh, so, wasn't that from where, around where you were? They made a movie out of that. What the hell is it called? Oh, Miracle on Ice. There no. you go. I yeah. knew you knew it. Yeah. Yeah, it was that same time period, right? 1980. Yeah. Yeah. So I was 10 at that time. I was three. So, I mean, <laughs> give me a little bit of fucking slack here. I remember that. I mean, I remember watching, uh, I was up, I was with my mom and dad. We were uh, up in the Northwoods, uh, cross-country skiing, and uh, we were watching uh, US, it was like the semifinal round, USA beat uh, Russia. Yeah. We were like in a little... TV watching it, just losing our minds. And then the next week, I was at a swim meet, and uh, some dude had one of those like portable TVs with the screens like this big. Yeah. But and there was like 150 people around it, just smashed three, around. Three, two, you know, and everybody's hugging each other. It was, I mean, that was really cool. Yeah. Uh, so I've always had a, a patriot patriotism streak. Uh, my buddy's dad uh, was in the Navy, and uh, and my buddy uh, Mikey, you know, hit, the guy's dad was in the Navy. Uh, he and I were both like, let's go in the Marines. And then my, uh, and the other guy, he was, Mikey was the drummer, and then Donnie was the bass player, and his dad was uh, a colonel in the reserves. Yeah. And so... What was the name of your band? Intensive Care. <laughs> Mainly because we spent a lot of time in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, we were, somebody was always getting fucked up. <laughs> like, <laughs> broken bones. Yeah, my I love it. Knives through the hand. Oh, God. Actually, Brian, the singer, one time, he was... Uh, a punker show and he he you know, like gonna stage dive he was a big dude great swimmer big dude but like it was like moses parting the red sea as soon as he leaped and uh leapt <sighs> that's not how you do that and he you know just head plant knock himself shitless so intensive care good name for the band i like it but uh yeah so my senior year uh this dude 
who was a jock actually, he's like, hey, let's join the Marines. You wanna join the Marines? And I'm like, fuck it, okay. And so I uh, did that delayed entry program in the Marines. So summer of, oh God, 1988, uh, the night before I'm supposed to go to boot camp, I get completely tatered and uh, <laughs> get into a fight, break my hand. Oh, shit. And they're like, you are a jackass. You are out of the delayed entry program. You know, you can't join the Marines. And so I'm like, fuck. All right. Uh, and then so I, you know, went and got a job, did a little bit of school. That's why I was working at Bounty Hanas and all that. And uh, and then I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to – I was starting to think about it again. And that's when my buddy, uh, the guy who did my tattoos, T, uh, I had a party one night again, drinking too much. And he just – you know, it was a huge house party in Milwaukee, which, you know, every weekend – there was one somewhere he just grabbed me and sat me down he's like hey jackass you know this is what you're gonna do tomorrow you're gonna you know when you're sober you're gonna walk over to the recruiting station and sign up i don't care what you know for which one yeah which branch did you know anything about the seals at that point uh i had heard of them you know uh, my aunt was in the navy not a lot of info on the seals in the 80s there wasn't no and my aunt was uh an ht in the navy did like 17 years yeah she was and, and you know she was you know, my mom's uh, youngest sister, so she was w- way closer in age to me. And we're still close. I talk to her all the time and uh, swaps these stories. You know, she was talking about, she knew I was a swimmer. She's like, you should become a diver. So I was going to look at that. But I didn't really have any idea of the SEALs. Uh, so T told me that. Then he said, the other option is I'm going to drag you in there. Told him to fuck off. And So the end state was the same. He was just giving you two choices and roads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two, the, heads I win, tails you lose. Yeah. So uh, I was like, okay. And uh, he decked me, and I was like, okay, I went in. And when I got to the recruiting station, they played that uh, Be Someone Special video. I'm like, okay, rad. That log PT, I want to do that. <laughs> Seriously, that's what that's what sold me was <laughs> log PT, seeing guys suffering. Yeah. Because, you know, like I think uh, part of that comes from, I think, competitive swimming. It's the most honest sport on earth, right? Because you, only you know if you're pushing – Given a hundred percent, yeah, you can look like you're doing it. The coach might think you're doing it. What was your event? Uh, when I was younger, it was uh breaststroke and I am and uh sprint freestyle. And then it just my knees were just like I had Osgood slaughters, my knees got destroyed from the frog kick. Yep, yep. and then uh, high school, it was a uh, hundred fly, 200 I am. Which 100 fly is not a fun evolution at sucks. all, especially when your coach is like, you should just swim fly during the workouts. I'm like, fuck that, man. But and yeah. then the IM, the individual medley, that's where you switch strokes at every certain distance. Yeah, right? like so uh, high school in Wisconsin was short course, 25 yard, yard pool. So it was, uh, you know, you do a 50 meter, 50 yard butterfly, 50 yard back, 50 yep. yard breast, 50 yard free. And uh, well, at least that part of Buds was probably pretty simple for you. Yeah, the water stuff was great, man. <laughs> I didn't mind it, you know. But uh, and so I, I was entertaining the idea of joining the Navy. And I was going to, if I'd go in, I'm going to be a team guy. Uh, and then, uh, that was, uh, at, then I started working at Benny Hanna's and let's dig into that just a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, well, let me back up a bit. I was a lifeguard at a country club, uh, turned 18, wasn't going to go to school. So I just stayed on as a janitor at said country club. Uh, and you know, I had my little blue poopy suit with the key back. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was rad. <laughs> and uh, just cleaning fat, pe- fat, rich people's spackle off the back of shitters. And uh, that's what it was, man. Like, God damn, dude. I don't care how much money you have. You, you don't know how to take a shit properly. <laughs> you know? So <laughs> that was horrible. Yeah, I bet. And uh, I did that for a while. And then I, then I decided to go to uh, – I did a semester, a year of college, and it bored me to tears. It was just like, okay, uh, not into it. So when I stopped college, I, you know, got the want ads out. Oh, Benny Hanna's. I like eating there. They need somebody to wash dishes and bust tables. Sign me up. So I went over there and applied for the job. You know, I was, every single human being, you should, you should wash dishes at a restaurant. <laughs> Work in a kitchen in a restaurant for at least a month of your life because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 you just see Americana, Bubis Americanus, man. It just, and it's all, all this glory. And, uh. So I was doing that, and then the the uh, manager came out to me, and he's like, "You know, hey, busboy son, you know, we want to have a we want an American chef." I'm like, "Fuck yeah, man, sign me up!" So I started uh, 
training to be a chef. Because they had that training stuff behind the curtain, if you will, at the yeah. Benihana's, right? Well, kind of. I mean, or it, do you just practice when they're closed? It's just in house, yeah. So uh, I was at the one in Milwaukee, and it was downtown. And so, like, after in between shifts, lunch and dinner, they'd teach me stuff. And then that one in particular had a lunch menu that nobody cooked. You didn't, uh, it was an express lunch, right? So a chef would be off to the side just cooking, yep. you know, the one or two items that you're allowed to get on that menu for, for the express lunch. And so I was doing that, getting feel for it. You know, then in between shifts, I was, you know, practicing flipping shrimp tails <laughs> and all that. And it, it started out like tables of two. And then, uh, which like the first one, I was I was I was shitting cinder blocks. Man. I was gonna say, what was your first performance like? It was horrible. In fact, <laughs> I had uh, I was spinning my knife around, put it back in my little knife sheath, and it like it, it's the sheath is like it's, there's that much millimeter width. The tip of the knife stuck on that, and I slid my hand on the knife. Oh! Just like I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> had a cockroach come out of the uh, grill and run across the. No way. Yeah, it came out of the corner. Shh on like one of those tables and it's like this just sucks. chop it up man put it right in the rice uh, I mean like people are just like mortified man I'm like uh, it's not up to me but I'd give you a free meal for that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, and, then I, and I got to the point where I could cook about a table of six or eight which is a full house on that and uh, they decided to shut that restaurant down and so they and you're the only white boy in there doing this at this yeah, point yeah and I was the uh, talking and uh, yeah I was the only white dude in there <laughs> it was it, that was it was weird, and then and, uh, they asked me if I wanted to stay with the company. I'm like, yeah, totally. Why not? I'm not doing anything, and because uh, my default was I could always join the Navy. Yeah. Once I got the medical waiver and the congressional waiver for the some of the arrests, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And so uh, myself, uh, this this guy from Thailand, Tom. Like the longest last name ever, I couldn't even begin to pronounce it. And then uh, Momi Yamasan, the uh, head chef for uh, th- at that one, we all moved down to uh, Lombard, Illinois, for the uh, the Benihana's there. And we, I was working for the head head chef, like like the original, like Benihana chef number one, Mister Cotto. No shit. Yeah. And so I was I was you know apprenticing under him, and that was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that place was surreal. Now, th- in that one, I was the only uh, native English speaker in the restaurant. It was, you know, you had a, a Japanese contingent, uh, Ecuadorian contingent, uh, Korean contingent, Filipino, Thai, and then my dumb ass. Do you ever just bust your skills out like doing omelets? All the time. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say for yeah. your family. <laughs> oh, I'm totally. I mean, you know, if I ever get, uh, you know, once at some point if I have the money, I'm going to build a full-blown. Teppanyaki tep- thing? Oh, hell yeah. It's the, it's, I love cooking on it. You know, and uh, it was rad. You know, so it was uh, it was fun cooking. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was some weird stuff too, like Momiyama. He, he always called me Taco, which is you know octopus, but it, you know it's basically slang for shithead. So uh, Taco, and he always slapped me around. But his English was terrible, and he couldn't drive, and so his apartment physically was unable to drive or just illegal. Just didn't know how to drive. Never drove a car. <laughs> And his apartment was on the way home to mine, or my apartment was, uh, his place was halfway yeah. to mine. And I got talked into teaching the smug how to drive uh, the car. And like every fucking night driving home, I got pulled over by the cops. And then, in fact, they even knew me by name. It's like, oh, it's Momiyama. And uh, just teach him, okay, cool, you can go now. And uh, And finally, I was just like, you know what, this is, uh, I loved it, but it was like, this is kind of lonely, man. <laughs> like, I don't have any, you know, I'd, every day, uh, every time I had a day off, I'd drive back up to Milwaukee to hang out with people. Yeah. Uh, so it was weird. So I was like, okay, you know what? Uh, the girl I seen at the time was living in Paris. So I, was, I quit, uh, you know, reluctantly and uh, just flew over to Paris and, you know, stayed there until I ran out of money and then uh, came back and joined the Navy. The Navy was still waiting for you. It was still waiting for me. So I got in and, uh, you know, boot camp, a school buds and uh my first platoon were doing this uh mcm exercise off camp pendleton so it we're like on, on the duluth or dubuque or some ship and it just sucked but uh there's a bunch of midshipmen on the you know doing their two-week crew summer cruise on the ship and the dude i was supposed to go in the marines with was one of those midshipmen oh so i'm rough. sitting there with my trident on he's like Bro, what happened? I'm like, man, I got liquored up, broke my hand, and now I'm a team guy. 
I'm like, sorry about that, man. Yeah, the but, Marine Corps had an issue with it, but the teams are they're fine. They're, they're totally good. okay with it. Yeah. And so yeah, it was a trip seeing him. But uh yeah, then you know, that that's kind of how I ended up here. But And how did your were you West Coast most of the time, other than your East Coast? Yeah, team? I started out Team Three. Yeah, which was Team Three was cool, man. It was, uh, and it, Team Three at that point was relatively short in the tooth. I mean, it, yeah, when they, they get, uh, it was ten years. Uh, 80s, 80, right? 83. Yeah, yeah, because ninety three we had the tenth anniversary brawl ball. I had a guy tell me one time he uh, served in Nam at Team Three. I was like, cool story, bro, and awesome. just left it at that. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, but we had a ton of Vietnam vets there. Yeah, and uh, so I was tattooed like this when I uh, went to Buds, and uh, we call that being on the radar. <laughs> oh yeah, I had, I had a massive target on my yeah, back. Yeah, you're gonna get some special attention or at least inquisitive yeah. looks and questions. But, oh, completely. But when they found out I was going to Team Three, they're like, "Oh, Mike Martin's over there," and so I'm like, you know, tattooed from here down in Vietnam vet, and yeah. Uh, so I check in in my whites to Team Three. Oh, you know, seaman tuition. You're supposed to report directly up to Petty Officer Martin in training cell. I'm like, <laughs> fuck, okay. <laughs> so they let me in, and I, I walk up there. I'm like, uh, you know, seaman, Tushin Tushin reporting for duty, <laughs> looking, you know, reporting for Petty Officer Martin. And he's sitting on this desk, and you know, he's got running shorts on, and he's just all tattoos. And uh, he pulls out, he opens his desk drawer, pulls out this huge dildo, <laughs> and he's he's slapping it on his head. He's like. Jock down, son. And so he had me down to my skivvies and checking uh, out your work, checking out my artwork. Yeah. While slapping himself in the face with a dildo, just slapping his head, and slapping on the table. And I'm like, that was my welcome to SEAL Team Three. It's like, <laughs> fuck. It was cool though, man. I loved it. It was, it was a good hybrid, you know, like, yeah. You had, next door, you had Stalag One with, uh, also known as SEAL Team One, also traditionally known as No Fun One. No Fun One, yeah. 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 You know, Fackety and Link would be out there yelling at all of us, Team Three guys for, Oh, you think Team 3 was bad? By the time I got to Team 5... Oh, Team 5 was out of control. I Basically, people at Team 1 refused to exist. We were in the same community. They were just like, you, get, you guys aren't SEALs. Yeah, we were, so like <laughs> Team 3 was the in-between, right? Yeah. yeah like, don't, it, but like every trip we ever went on, you know, you go to Kodiak, you go to Fallon, wherever. It's like, and uh, part of the in-brief was, and don't do what the platoon from Team 5 did last time they were up here. You're like... That sounds about right. Yeah. It, it was, was a roving shit show for a while. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, it was, well, so you got to your first team in what, 80? No, no, uh, I checked into Team 3 in uh, April of 92. Okay, so early. Yeah. About f- yeah, about five years before I did. Yeah. And then what'd you do up until pre-911? Uh, I went over to Damnak. So in- uh, In what year? Uh, I screened during my first platoon. They laughed us out of the room. We tried to. And yeah. Like, you guys fucking wait. And Which then- now, I guess, is not that uncommon, I guess- well, yeah. at least when I was, well, in 2013, I knew more people who were finishing their screening or beginning their screening at the end of their first platoon. They were looking at it. Yeah, that's when, and they, they, that was too early. So then we went back, uh, they came out the next year and we screened. Uh, it was during my second platoon. And uh, then they canceled Green Team one of those years. Not enough interest? I, I, don't, th- I don't know. Yeah, I think it was something like that. They, huh. I, I don't think there's enough bodies. So I did another deployment. And, uh, and then in 97, I, I went out and started Green Team. When you did your screening, mm-hmm. did they – so you ended up going to the mobility side of the house. Yeah. But when you screened – because even when I screened in 01, you know, it was uh, – they asked you the question, like, do you care if you end up at assaults or mobility? And, of course, the answer they're looking for is no. no. Right. All I want to do is be over there. So yeah. you went into it. It was open-ended? Uh yeah, they, Meaning they, you could have gone assaults or boats. Yeah, because we did. We, we yeah. went through green team together. We uh, would they make the split? Uh, it it would it, it would go in and out, right? So, but they told you at least at some point, right? Like, oh they, no, no, yeah. like we knew right away. It was it was it was delineated from day one. Really? Yeah. It For was, my class, yeah. two months into it, they read out a list. Oh, really? They, uh, we were at Morana finishing up jumping. <clears throat> huh. Last day there, the chief in charge gets up. And he's like, "Listen, there's." Two ways we can read this list, you know. I can read the names of the people going to boats, or I can read the names of the people not going. How do you guys want it? <laughs> and it yeah. was it was a it was an emotional day for some people oh, because completely. they wanted to be on the assault side of the house, and then they actually split us there. Yeah. Um, so we continued with more of a assaulter based focus. Sure. Mount more helo work with the one sixtieth, more just clearance, yeah, all that stuff, and then the boat guys were just. 
they're like, yeah, we're just getting issued our back brace for this fucking 17,000 mile transit oh we're going to go do. Oh my God, dude. Yeah. Like I, I, initially I was like, well, fuck, you know, I, when I looked at the breakdown, I think they took a lot of the, like they took all the E5s, right? The younger guys and go, okay, we're two going to go to assaults, one degree, two to assaults, one degree. But it, I don't know how they did it, but like our green team class, like the personalities in it were like everybody got along like fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was kind of like a, I didn't think I would like it at all. I mean, I didn't, you know, I was kind of a disaster and, you know, driving stuff and uh, I loved it, man. I thought it was cool as shit. Uh, well, let's be honest. You get to drive some of the coolest shit on the face of the planet. All those things are ridiculous. But yeah. I, I do remember the very first day we went out like it was, uh, you know, day two after, or actually after we did like the the PRTs that the second week. Yep. Uh, we went out. I remember going down to Alice Creek and we get in the boats, and it's one of those gray days. And you, you know, when you get around the uh, the bridge, yeah, heading out the inlet, and it's just, like, and there's chop in the inlet. You're like, oh yeah. fuck! And then they get on step. I'm just like, this is what I signed up for. Holy <laughs> fuck! Like just like your nuts. This are like, is my life now. You're just getting beaten, man. Like your gut hurts. You like you remember those canockers? Yep. That's what your nuts feel like. And, just yep. go, do, 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 and you're just beaten. And I'm, those boats are crazy. We're talking about H sacks or high speed assault craft. Yeah. They're, how, what are the engines of those things? Uh, I don't know what they are now. We had uh, well, when I first got there, we had the 580 uh, gaff. You know the uh, you know there wasn't the uh, it wasn't the H sacks yet. Well, they were still H but it was like the first version, so they're loud as shit. Oh, okay. you know, and then uh, they got the underwater exhaust. Yep, and those were six hundreds, twin six hundreds, twin six hundreds. Right? Yeah, and then, we, <laughs> then we went to the uh, twin, uh, you know, six fifty Chevy big blocks. Dude, when you guys would throttle down that oh, that spool up, you're love just it. fucking holding on for dear life. You, you are gonna get beaten, man. I you mean, are, and it sucks. Is in the back. You're yeah. like, I have no control over anything, but I'm gonna attempt to be in this boat when it arrives. At its station. And then, of course, as the new guy, Andy, get up front, get all the gear out. You know. Oh, that sucked, <laughs> man. Like, I, that, like, I was just like, why do we have Zodiacs? Why, why, oh. I'll just drive the boat in for you, man. Like, or swim. Because getting Where'd in you? that bow compartment. Oh, it was and so the, bad. The spare props, or you can't see it. You're clonking your head on that and cutting the shit Fumes, out. Fumes, and it's just sitting in there. <gasps> and it, yeah, you immediately lose all spatial awareness. So it's I would just horrible. like hold on, grip the top of it as hard as I could, and just try to reach everything else in there. Oh God, it was sucked. I hated yeah. getting up there. That's why. I, uh, Sometimes being a new guy sucks. Yeah, that's why I really worked hard at getting good at wheelman, <laughs> so I didn't have to do that shit because I hated that. It was rough. Yeah, but it was cool. Like I, I mean, I thought like uh, once you get good at it and proficient, like we wouldn't even bother going out unless it was just gnarly. Well, there's no training value on a there glass isn't. day, and and there was like I remember at times like going alongside and like. Looking at the fantail, you know, like on the the helo yeah. deck, like I can't believe. Oh, just the swell different. Yeah, yeah. and uh, or, I mean, you have it's just a dangerous. It's it's job. it's it's hard to describe. So I was the lead climber for a while, and you know, getting the magnets on, oh. and just sitting there, <laughs> positioning as you guys are driving the boats up, and I'm just like, this is my life. Yep, and it's about to be over, and then just committing, ka -ting! like getting as high as you can, and like getting ripped off as a swell would come up. Oh and, yeah, and your magnets are just like it. Man overboard. Oh there fuck, goes the man. Over man buoy. Yeah, the man overboard. The best part about being the lead climber was that you got to get the fuck out of the boat first. The, oh, dude. the worst part about being the lead climber is you get to get the fuck out of the boat first. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, because the guy hasn't quite got the zen state yet, yeah. man. Like it really is. Like I, I remember. Uh, like doing underways, you're just being mentally exhausted. Like five minutes of just the utmost concentration. Oh, when you guys are holding on station, yeah, because it's because you're doing the wheeling and throttling, and it's just you have to you get in a zen state, man. Like you have to be. You see uh, that in with tune the, at the ocean. The one sixtieth pilots too, Same like thing. the little bird guides. Yeah, I don't know how many times I usually tried to be in the front right skid on the little birds, and I would just kind of look over at the the input that they were putting. Like the helicopter was, to me, I could have like balanced a cup of water in my hand yeah but that dude up there was so front sight focused on his reference point amazing and just slamming controls what i would say like pretty close to full deflection and that thing was just like bump it's amazing it was unbelievable and i bet they are equally just as smoked at the end of that oh i'm sure it's 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 such a challenge and then uh yeah it's it's uh it was gnarly though i mean that you look at like uh just just going anywhere any kind of transit you know it's like you know it's a 
especially out in Virginia Beach and going up the Atlantic seaboard, it's shallow for so far, so it's all wind kind of driven swells, and it's yeah. like a two and a half second interval, which isn't bad. Like skip, 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 and then you hit the wave that's like a four second interval, and just like the bottom drops out, and you just everything buckles, and you're one of the most important lessons I learned on the H sax. Don't hold it like this. <laughs> Is when the driver and throttle man duck. Oh, <laughs> you better duck too. <laughs> yeah, because it means a wall of green water is about to come face shot you. I've got I've got guys nods just detonating off. Oh, completely. Or full coon eyes, yeah. raccoon eyes, because it <laughs> smashes them to the face. And yeah. I was the recipient of that. And then I would start paying attention to you guys up front. And any time you guys would hit the deck, I was just like, ah! <laughs> That sucks, man. Because you can't see it. No, our first night, Ron, yeah. it was in Chesapeake Bay like that. And yeah, we lost all of our nods. Like just that first wave hit and you're just like, whoops. Okay. Were you ever there when the, one of those suckers burned in on a jump? Because oh, I had yeah. legendary tales of those things just detonating. It was like, a, yeah, there was like, uh, we had a bunch in a row that well, happened. The, first off, yeah. and I think you can find this on YouTube as well. This is a one that's worth looking. Yeah. The dual boat deployment out of the back of like a C5. It it's is cool as fuck. Well, the speed that that second boat is coming out. So they have the boats. 160 knots. Yeah, back to back. Yeah. And they'll throw a, a pilot shootout, essentially. Yeah. It's sitting there behind the airplane. They'll release that. And the first H-Sack, and they're on uh, the metal, what do they call this? Pallet, metal pallet. Yeah. And the aircraft. wheels on the aircraft, you know, there's little wheels for loading gear. And those things are smoking by the time the first one oh, goes yeah. out. But you'll see it. It pulls a tether to the second one. Yep. Which now has the time to accelerate from its position all the way forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. To the ramp. And the the angle that those suckers come out, and of it, course, all your gear's in there. Everything. And then you just see these little dudes running after it because they're stuffed up front. But I had heard stories of, you know, that it ejecting out and it would pitch to the attitude where the parachute should come off. Yeah. And then no parachute and then just boom. Yeah, it was, it was the second. Uh, yeah, it was like a, there was some issue. It was like, a, like the 20 cent L ring that. Of course. Frapped in the uh, <laughs> Challenger. You know, it was. It's it a five million dollar bundle, and it was done in by yeah three cent plastic. Yeah, it was crazy. It was just like a second boat, and it just you do like shoot out the back and do like that wily e. coyote pause, and then just <laughs> woo, and just you know it, it would hit, and the engines would just blow out the back end, and <sighs> it's a fucking yard sale out there. That somebody's writing that check, and then they've cut them away off the uh, you know slinging. Yeah, which is uh, starts oscillating. It's like see ya. Well, the choice is cut the boat away, or we all die. Oh yeah, totally. So I'm gonna go with the cut the boat away too. Completely. Yeah. But those boat drops are rad. I did uh, uh when McTie was a skipper, he tapped me to like run uh because we we're on standby, I think, and whatever, and we were around, and uh, he he's like, hey, just uh, JM, you know, recall jumps, and we'll do it. Like it was a C5, but it was a uh, three single boat drops. Oh sweet. And so, so you could probably get the practice so the, rotations. Yeah, in. the yeah. first boat went out, and like most of you know, I think it was Gold or whomever, whomever, and then, chased uh, it. The second boat went out, you know, done the pass. Second boat went out, and uh, another group, and then the last pass was just myself, uh, Char Booty, and uh, his tandem passenger, and uh, water tandems. And Bad so, idea. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that C five man, it's like a mile long, and that boat's there. And, you know, from that perspective, it yeah. looks like it's aiming right at you. So we're kind of on the ramp waiting for it, and it goes. And uh, it was cool. You're that just thing, praying it doesn't jump the skids. Oh, yeah. They, they, <laughs> yeah, you just, you'd just be a pink done. goo, man. Yeah, you'd never even know what happened. But that was cool as fuck. That thing was flying, bro. I couldn't believe it the first time I did. Because we'd watched the video, I think, in Green Team, or they were showing us something. Yeah. I, first time I was in the plane, and they, when they cut that first boat out, I was like, holy cow. So cool. And then when it auto-ripped out the second one, though, and just the... The of the rollers no. on, and that angle that it ejected. I'm telling for people listening, it's worth it's worth a Google. I'll it see is. if I can find one and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, but, there's a bunch on YouTube. And yeah. as cool as it looks on that video and what it sounds like, it's indescribable how much more awesome it is in person. The 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 worst part is, uh, and this is like one of the this is the gnarliest injuries I've seen was uh, we're doing a big exercise and you know it's, uh, one pass I think so everybody's hauling ass out the. Uh, back of the boat uh ed hill running and he slipped he got or he got you know everybody's oh. assholes and elbows and his fingers went underneath the roller oh shit yeah it was it, and it, let me guess they bent in a direction not normally designed oh <laughs> god man like and it was one of those it, it's a start of an eight hour evolution yeah. so it's like hey ed man you like just you know go you know why don't you take your stuff off and Red chill out down. in the back he's yeah. like yeah, I'll probably pass out if I do that. So he, he's that guy's hard as hell. His hand looked like a, somebody took a rubber glove and 
It's wow. huge. Yeah, he probably had some pins and hardware put in there afterwards. Oh, yeah, it's permanently bent and all that. That was gnarly. Yeah, so you were there 9-11 then? Yeah, that day. It was... Uh, How were things at the at the command? <laughs> a little chaotic. Uh, I mean, so, real, looking back now, nobody had a goddamn clue what was going on. No, it was, it was really funny. So, like, I had uh, decided prior to 9-11 happening, because I had a known, I wouldn't have left, but I was like, okay, you know, my, my wife and I have a newborn. Uh, she wants to be back out in California by our family to, you know, get the grandparents to enjoy their grandson. And uh, so I and, and so I said, hey, I'm going to uh, go to SQT because I remember being out at Marana jumping and seeing Mike Lou out there working the jump pro, you know, our jump mm -hmm. program. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, SQT. I'm like, okay, you can come out here and jump? Yeah, He's like, yeah. Augment, yeah. And I'm like, cool, I'll, okay, I'll do that because I'm, I'm, my wife's ready to move. Uh, Slash kill you. Kill, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> one, yeah. That, that's actually, yeah, more accurate. Yeah. Like, okay, I've had enough of this place. Yeah. And, have you uh, had enough fun, Jason? Because I have. We're leaving. Uh, no, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Okay, uh, fair enough. I've got the play. And so and I remember Perry coming down, uh, CMC, going, hey, uh, what can I do to keep you to stay? I'm like, I'm like I'll clean the bell right off the boat barn. I, I really don't want to go, but I also... You know, family comes first in my, yep. and he's like, absolutely, you know, good. And uh, he's like, cool, whatever. And then 9-11 then happens, and, and uh, Tapper, Dave, uh, he was, a, you know, we were, we were at the at the command for a couple months, and so we were doing a Spanish class. And uh, we came out, went on a break, and, like, he comes, uh, he goes, holy shit, plane just hit the World Trade Center. And he's, he's a Jersey dude, and... Uh, and then we were kind of standing watching it, and the other one hits. They're like, everybody's heart started. You could see, like, there was, yeah. like, a, a tension, like, holy crap. Everybody, I think, thought the fr it was just like, wow, what a shitty pilot. How yeah. could you possibly hit that building? Yeah, right. Or it was like, I did, when I first woke up, I just assumed it had been an accident. Totally. And then shortly after, the second one goes in, and, and like, like that. And then the Pentagon. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was a little bit chaotic. I mean, we you kn we, we knew right then and there we were under attack you and we you know we assumed it was al-qaeda and uh you know we were it's just it was a little bit of chaos chaos you know like okay are we gonna you know get our suits on and go be air marshals and what what do we you know what's gonna happen so the fact that they floated that idea is hilarious to me it is awesome yeah <laughs> <I know. laughs> well, well, what else gonna do it and yeah. uh and then all of a sudden it calmed down and everybody just took a, a collective uh knee but I remember, like, you know, calling my wife, going, "Hey, you tracking this stuff? Yeah, cool. I, you know, I might be busy at work. I for might a be touch. busy at work. And, but then it, it really calmed down. And uh, so, you know, the next day, I immediately, you know, hey, Perry, <laughs> I'm not leaving. <laughs> and uh, and then I had everybody in the element doing the same thing. And uh, he came down. He's like, "Hey, jackass, you know, this thing. You know what's going to happen? We're going to launch a couple tomahawks in, uh, you know, in Afghanistan. We're going to call it good." Fast forward twenty years, and I'm like, you know, it was, it, it was what I needed to hear. Yeah, uh, it was wildly off in his prediction of how it was going to play out. But uh, everybody was. Yeah, I don't think anybody was betting on twenty plus years. No, I thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, the day I left was the day uh, guys went in. Yeah, and uh, that was a bitter pill. But I, you know, I did. We did. We thought it'd be pretty quick. And uh, what rank were you? I as chief. I made okay, chief. so you made chief there. Yep. Yeah, I had you know, Rudy do the old. Uh, pinning ceremony that was pretty cool that is awesome yeah and uh yeah so I, yeah nobody i didn't realize it was gonna go was, who went over was it red that went over first it had to have been right because no, Anaconda. It, was, it was blue did they yeah oh that's right for the they did the cars they rescue yep yeah okay and then red slash retrieval slash psd yep and then uh and they sent in the true pipe hitters yeah, that's Scold. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it, and it, you know, it, I'm it, just joking, people. Fucking calm down. Yeah, I know. <laughs> get uh, people get very ear Oh yeah, they'll get very irritated about that. I know, man. Just joking. Funny. I, I don't think it really bugged me until uh, Tap got killed. That one was heavy. Yeah. That one. That one hurt. I remember because uh, Danny Marrow had just made Chief, you know, and he called me, and I'm like, "Yeah, fucker, congrats!" And he's like, "Oh, you didn't hear." And it's like my heart sank. Yeah, you know, and, those aren't good calls. And he's like, he just couldn't, he, he couldn't even get it out. He just like tap. 
Yeah. I'm like, damn. And I remember telling my wife and like, you know, Jared, uh, Tap's youngest and my son are the same age. You know, Shane's first birthday party was, you know, Dave and, and Tracy and, uh, Jared, yep. you know, and, and, you know, my wife and me and Shane. And, uh, that was heavy. Like I've never heard my wife, uh, scream and shriek. Like that was. Yeah. That was the first gold squadron c- combat deployment. I'm sorry, combat uh, fatality. Yeah, in OEF, OIF. I don't know about anything before that because that was before my time. But yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, there was yeah. training. I mean, there training. Do you remember how small the memorial wall was at the Sunno Ops building? Yeah, yeah, it's huge. It, it is yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. I remember when they did that. I mean, it was, you know, the the lion's share of it was uh, Grenada. Yes, and then a few training accidents. You know, and it was, uh, and I remember a lot of those training accidents. You know, like uh, Carl Clearwater and how did he die? Uh, I think it, 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 they're jumping uh, Chesapeake, and uh, on the oh, weekend was skydiving. I remember that. Yes, yeah. it was. I, I think, think he has, he might hit the tail with his head. Uh, was, was that, that him? I think no. I think it was. Uh, he had a chest mounted altimeter on a small rig, and uh, like it was a ditch, and I think it he just. Oh, um, you're right. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like it, yeah, it was it was like kind of weird and random, and I, I think. Somebody like broke their leg on the, the same, you know, so nobody knew what happened. It was, and then, you know, a kid, uh, it was a couple, it was a parachute, another parachute accident, I remember. And, but yeah, it was a small. That wall, you know, it, yeah. I mean, that, I remember that wall looking at it, and there was, if I remember correctly, there was a couple pieces of, what is it? It's usually like dark black marble. Is that what yeah. you say it is? Or maybe granite, polished granite, granite something like that. Yeah. And I think there was four pieces, and there was only riding on one of them. Yeah. And now it's like, I mean, I, you, it's, it's, it's sad, and, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, extortion added another, you know, over a dozen people to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Oh, it's horrible, man. It's been, yeah, been tough over the years to get those, to get those calls. It sucks. I mean, it sucks even more is to get calls from the guys who made it through that time period and then see either something catastrophic happens, stupid. Yeah. Or the fucking soup de jour for right now seems to be killing themselves. Yeah, that one's horrible. Fuck, like, man. It's uh, that's a real problem, man. And yeah. you know, being locked down doesn't make it any easier, too. It just gets you angry, and you know, uh, and then the you know the self medication. That's why that like the ibogaine treatments and the DMT and the kind of the psychedelics. I, I really, uh, do you think there's any way though that the government would ever support that? Ah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Actually, I think it'll, it'll. I think so, but I think it's gonna be a long time from now, and I my worry is that it will be. Well, I guess I'm not necessarily worried because right now people are seeking it out on their own, so yeah. they're finding ways to get it. So if they have interest or they think, and enough guys have been through it, like we're talking with you yesterday, yeah. I've yet to talk. Well, I know of one guy, like right. we described, that didn't have the experience that I have heard from every other person. Yeah, so it exists and people are getting it, but I think the people need like they need it now. And I, yeah. my worry is that it will be approved, but five, seven, ten years from now. Yeah. And not that it won't be effective then, but I mean, I hope we're still not in sustained combat operations five, seven, ten years from now. So the people who would benefit from it the most, yeah, they need it now. I think I could see it getting fast tracked uh, for th- those use cases. Yeah. Maybe I mean because the evidence is so compelling. How many guys do you know? I mean, total uh, ballpark or anecdotal have, have gone through. Uh, probably 15 or 20 yeah. that I know personally have done it. And, uh, every one of them has had fantastic results, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, Johnny Walker doing it, you know? Thank God, man. Like what if, you know. Saved his life. Oh, I, I, I think yeah. so. Yeah. You know, I want to. Or our buddy Johnny. I mean, the other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh. Totally. So it's. it's what huge. did you expect going into it? Uh. Just to kind of, like I was talking about, like a fresh coat of powder on the brain, just to uh, my, what I was hoping to achieve was to, you know, uh, get rid of all the baggage, man, like the uh, dwelling upon things in the past. Like, like I wanted to have a clean slate in my head and acknowledge all the dumb shit or bad shit or scary stuff and, and, uh, and go forward with a, a, a clean slate in life and, and and chart my own territory get out of these ruts you know whether it's from drinking too much or or uh you know social media or you know addiction's addiction yeah it is yeah right it was interesting 
what you were saying uh, yesterday about how after that your desire to be on social media was you basically said trap door like it was gone yeah it really was it's like i'll uh like which I to me, which to me though, not to interrupt you, yeah. highlights how fucking addictive by design those things are designed. Oh, to be. completely. And it's you know, it, I think you know, you see some of the turmoil going on today in the country. It it, it stems from the short attention span, instant gratification uh, mindset. I'm gonna, and I'm going to add lack of critical and objective thinking. Too. Completely. I'm yeah. terrified by how malleable the United States population is. Yeah, right. You know, what I mean, like you, I've always operated the assumption like the first report is always wrong. On anything, and that's always or question first before believing and you know buying an airplane ticket, you know, or yeah. committing yourself to a stupid action, yeah, which you will then blame on somebody else. Like that's not how that works. No, and and whatever <laughs> whatever the first story that comes out is, you yeah. look at it, go, oh, that, and that's now that's gospel, and you you forget about it because your attention pans, you know, you're not going to follow up on it and get the truth, and yep. uh, and so it's uh, yeah, that part's frightening. But so my expectations were to. Uh, yeah, just kind of clean house in my head a bit. Did they help you set that expectation? Absolutely. I was going to say, I mean, from I have zero experience with psychedelics, but an immense interest in the benefit that can come from yeah. that. And it, one thing I hear when I talk to people about, you know, set and setting are incredibly important. Totally. And so you uh, had to go and seek, the, seek it on your own with uh, many, many, I just got a message the other day from two people who were down there. Cool. Um, and again, totally positive messages. Yeah. And, and uh, but yeah, I bet, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people. I'm sure some people come down there and they don't necessarily have a, an idea of what they want to get out of it. They know they need help, so it's good to hear that they help you lay out a framework. Yeah, there's a whole workbook that you do beforehand, and really, you really, you know, do the due diligence and read through it and really put some thought into it. Like I spent, uh, like mine was a target of opportunity that so it was kind of short fuse. So I had about ten days to mentally prepare for it. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I took a, you know, a little bit of time just to like you know, be mindful, mindfulness, be in the moment, meditate a bit or just think and, and really, okay, what do I want to try to clear your head uh, going into it and set, you know, four or five expectations or what I want to achieve from it mm -hmm. and, and knowing that in my head. And then, uh, and then you go, you get down there and you, you go through the ceremony and, uh, and it's good that it's a ceremony because you're going to trip your balls off. And so if you, if you're cavalier about it, uh, it, it could end up bad. So it, it adds some, uh, spirituality, I guess, if you will, to the, uh, to the movement, like, and so, or the, uh, to the moment. And then you, you take it and, you, and you're in a nice room, uh, comfortable on a bed. How uh, long does it take to start taking effect? Oh. Uh, sure it varies by person. But. Yeah, like, it, it de definitely did. Cause, like, my body did not metabolize it fast at all. So, like, it, cause it makes you nauseous, right? So, you're, there's, we're in a room, uh, you're hooked up to an EKG, you have an IV line in in case you need to push fluids or something. Uh, and everybody's, laying down and uh like an hour two hours in I'm, I'm hearing everybody just getting sick and and i'm barely and and some of them are talking out loud and stuff and uh <laughs> yelling and shit and uh it's kind of weird it's a it's a weird environment yeah and and i'm just starting to i'm starting to you know get it i'm like oh cool this is fine you know this is neat and seeing all sorts of nice pleasant things and then uh and I was going on for another hour or two, and everybody's in the background, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it hit me, and it was, you know, 10 hours of, like I said, getting poked in the chest, getting yelled at. That's a long ride. It was, and uh, and then the nausea hit me. Like, I, it was, like I, I was saying, uh, it, it reminded me like a Pink Floyd, the wall cartoon, you know, that kind of like angry, metallic, black and white and gray cartoon. It was a baggage shoot, and... There was like creatures hucking baggage, my baggage, down into an incinerator. And then I just remember a voice screaming at me, like deafening, telling me to purge. And I did for like about three more days. <laughs> it it took forever to- I'm not uh, a fan of being nauseous, man. Three days of just porcelain god praying would suck. It sucked. And you couldn't, you, and, and it just, it dicks up your equilibrium. So trying to walk, like you got to get to use the bathroom and it's like, it feels like I got a kettlebell hanging off one side of my head, and I'm and really yeah. It was really weird, like how. Uh, and then I, to the DMT, okay. what forty eight hours later? Yeah, so then the next day you kind of come down, and I was still I felt like shit, so I took an IV. But uh, you kind of recuperate and, and go through you know what just happened in your head and start you know thinking about it and uh, you know appreciating the moment, if you will, or the opportunity to kind of clean all that stuff out and then the next day you do the dmt and that was uh 
really fucking cool. How how do you ingest that? Is it smoked? Yeah, it's like a crack pipe. Okay, it's like a little. It's a, like a, it's a pellet in there, and you, it literally it's a crack pipe. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you do a small hit first to get a feel, and you're like, oh, this okay. Yeah, and then you do uh, you take one, and you just kind of fall back, and then as it starts to wear off, I can do up to two more. You know, how long does it last? It's only like 15 minutes, maybe. But it's the coolest shit ever. I mean, it's like it. Uh, I kind of came out of it like, holy crap, man! Like the whole world is, you know, it, it, everything's connected, and it's it. You just kind of uh, that's the most spiritual one of them all. I mean, you really feel like, uh, like you're kind of one with the universe. It sounds like crazy, but it's it's the same thing I hear over and over again. Yeah, though. It, and it was like beautiful. And I mean, when you die, right, your body releases DMT, so. Uh, you know, when people talk about seeing the white light and all that, that that's what it's your body. I, it must, it's, you know, a, a natural mechanism, I guess. Cause you know, when you die, you're, I think your brain is conscious for another 10, 15 minutes. So imagine what that'd be like knowing, fuck, I'm dead, you know, and just screaming trapped inside. Instead you get this beautiful, <laughs> fuck. that's a little heavy though. Think about it. I mean, it was cool though. Yeah. It, can you even, uh, I've heard Rogan talks about it a bunch, and he he says that it's impossible to to describe what you saw, yeah, like accurately. Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. Like, you, there's just no way that the voca- the voc- human vocabulary is just too limited to encapsulate it. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, because it's it's just the colors. For me, it was colors and just the geometric patterns. A lot. Yeah, yeah. I do remember though. The only thing I could really like remember is kind of at the end. I felt like I was like on a spaceship facing out. Like I, I felt like it, I, for whatever reason, it stuck in my head was, uh, and I might just have made it up after the fact. I can't remember, but f- when I think about it, the end of it, I remember, like looking out. I guess what was a bridge of a, a spaceship, looking out into the universe, the expanse, and like, and and like a little something guide type thing next to me, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then then I, then it, then you kind of wake up out of it and. Uh, you know, there's people around you who, yeah. who, uh, who are kind of doing the same thing. Well, no, no, you, you do this one one at a time. Okay. And so the doctor's there, and the and the lady who is uh, administering it, and and kind of a counselor, and like you're, and it's like you're in this nice comfy pillow, and <laughs> and there's cool music going on in the background, and you kind of come out of it, and you're looking around, and it's just it's so cool, man. It sounds incredibly powerful. It is, and it's. Uh, I, I hope the. Yeah, it's like with marijuana too, you know, like, oh, it's bad. It's like, no, you know. Well, it can be. Yeah, I'm sure you could abuse, be. you could abuse, well, you can abuse water and kill yourself if you sure. wanted to. I don't know why anybody would do that. But if people are going to sit there and say that marijuana is dangerous for you and then not address alcohol. Yeah, you're nuts. In the same sentence, which yeah. is, just happens to be the most readily available drug to humans, it seems like, at least in the U.S. Totally. I mean, and, and I'll ask people this, would you rather have some, not in, there's more options than this, but I'll say, would you rather have somebody drinking and driving or high and driving? The, the correct answer is neither. Right. Obviously. Yeah. But if I force you down those two pathways, yeah. People are like, well, I'd probably have somebody who's just high. I'm like, yeah. Alcohol is, you know, proven to express violence. Totally. In adult males. People who are bombed out of their mind, the highest I've ever seen people, they were doing one of two things <laughs> snacking or eating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were generally tired. Or just stuck to the couch. Yeah. It, I mean, and I'm not advocating for either. People can make up their own choice. Right. But, I mean, I, I say within a couple of years, I'd be amazed if it wasn't legal U.S.-wide. Oh, I'm sure it will be here Yeah, I think, the, I think the die is pretty much cast on that. Montana passed uh, yeah, recreational cool. as of January 1st of this year. I don't know what it looks like actually putting it into practice. Yeah. I mean, on paper, it's legal, but who knows how long it'll take them to do that. But it's, yeah, it's like anything else. I have no doubt that there are some incredible positive benefits. I mean, glass of wine a day. Is proven to have some health benefits as sure. well too. A case and a half of wine a day proven to not have health benefits. Yep. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> it's, I, and I think that's what will happen. Uh, hopefully, what they'll do with the psychedelics is, is you know, uh, I mean, that, you know, my personal beliefs are just everything should be legal anyway. Uh, but I, I imagine I, you have probably a pretty libertarian stance on those things. I do. Yeah, as do I. Very much. Uh, very much. So I mean, I'd be if the hypocrisy wouldn't be too much for me. I'd you know. An, an, a narco capitalist, if you will, you know, like just <laughs> free exchange of ideas and goods between people, you know, and, yep. and who gives a shit what color you are, what race you are, or, uh, gender orientation, and uh, yeah. cares about any of that shit, you know. 
Uh, How much money do you think we've spent as a nation on the war on drugs? Ah, uh, trillions. Yeah. And I mean, what what do we got from it? We have, you know, you have a shit ton of people incarcerated for for what? Selling coke or crack or marijuana or taking it? I mean. There's a, there's gender, I mean, how many thousands of people are in jail, particularly in, you know, the uh, minority communities because of the war on drugs? I mean, that is messed up. Man. Yeah. Like, and I don't, I don't necessarily have a solution for it, but I think we could definitely have done better and can do better in the future. Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah. It's. And you don't want to, you know, this this Puritan stigma of the drugs and stuff. You know, with the psychedelics, I hope it at least gets like with the VA and addiction centers and people with mental health issues, uh, that they at least, you know, consider it as a viable therapy and treatment form. Because it's, uh, it's frustrating, man. Like for like my, when I was group one CMC in my last couple of years, it, it was, I got to the point where I was telling the docs like quit, one, you know, quit prescribing painkillers, you know, to guys. Because what happens is guys get hurt, they get enough Percocets or whatever, you know, to become a heroin addict. People don't believe me about getting Ziploc bags full of pills. Yeah. No. I'm not, I mean, we're talking sandwich, not gallon. Yeah. But I bet if you asked them hard enough, they'd give you a fucking gallon bag. Completely. And it's like, <laughs> no, what, what are we doing? So, you know, a young team guy, okay, I, you know, you're messed up. Uh, and all you want to do is get back in the machine. Yeah, but and, you're cleared hot to take all these pills, yeah. you know, and, and so you finish it not realizing that, hmm, odds are pretty good, you could become addicted. And then you have a, an addiction problem. And uh, so I was like, w you guys, docs, please quit doing that because it's, it's taking good people yeah. and it becomes, out, it, it, it's immediately out of your control, you know. Well, and it, and it shows, you know, I don't think the docs have any malicious intent. No. They're, they're going through the tool belt of available tools that they have. Yeah. I want doctors and professionals to have as many viable options as possible. Absolutely. Because then you, I mean, maybe for some people, actually, I know for a fact, for some people, they need those painkillers. Yeah. You yeah. smash your head um, and you have a like a compression or a spinal, you're probably going to need that. Totally. But for other guys, you know, maybe acupuncture, maybe send them to the Cairo, maybe yeah. PT, like all these other things that you could escalate along the way. And then that's the final step. Or don't fire and forget with it. Don't just give it to them. And then, yeah, don't you check know, it you with had them. To, you have to main, you know, stay on top of it. And I think, uh, you know, I think what, what, what when it became uh, more noticeable was when I was talking to one of the docs about it. I'm like, what the fuck? And, and he's like, look, uh, the medical profession made a shift where pain is now something you, uh, it's, it's actually like a, like a disease, right? So you have to treat pain as opposed to being a byproduct of whatever injury you have. Hmm. Uh, it's another, it's something you treat for now too. To, That's an interesting uh, shift in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know the, that's only coming from him. So I've never confirmed that with another doctor, but that kind of goes in line with the amount of opioids that get prescribed. Oh, well, pain. Yeah. Oh, you're in pain here. That's a, that's a problem. Yeah. That, that prescription and then the no checking in on the back end is, catastrophic leave people yeah. to their own devices like that's not a it's sad not a good recipe so where'd your so you when you left you went to sqt where'd your career go post 9 11 all the way till the end yeah so i did sqt for a couple of years and then uh dipped over to team seven uh supposed to be a platoon chief but i made e8 uh coming out of sqt so they the the whole task unit chief thing was kind of new yeah and uh as part of a requirement so i got thrown in as the task unit chief from uh at Team Seven, Are they now calling it the SEA. Yeah, okay. T, T U S E A, and, Senior Enlisted Advisor. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, so I had two platoons, uh, Echo and Foxtrot, and I had like and then J, like Jason Torrey was like my LPO for the task <laughs> unit. I had uh, Heil was with me, and uh, Good was one of the platoon chiefs, and then uh, Billy Helmers, Harless, some really good dudes, man. Yeah, it was a, it was a tight uh, group of guys. And uh, that, that's when I started getting into CrossFit was with a couple of those young guys, Hakey and... Uh, I had forgotten you'd come over in the morning classes when I had CrossFit Coronado. Yeah. And I had completely forgotten about the bag of dicks cue that I would occasionally That was awesome. Use. Yeah, you did that. I think it was Lori or somebody. You have to connect with the person you're trying to coach and choose the <laughs> vernacular that will have the response that you're looking to elicit. And with Lori, yes, that was... That worked. It worked. Yeah. It, it immediately shifts. She's yeah. a cop, man. Yeah, yeah. She and yeah, she's a savage in all the best ways. Yeah. Lori's awesome. That was actually really fun. Yeah, that was a good time. But so 
I guess getting back, uh, Team Seven, we uh, that was a really trippy deployment in that. Uh, OEF, right? Yeah, uh, OIF. It was Iraq. Okay. So that's when the PSD mission started about halfway through our workup. Like, oh fuck! Like I thought I just left that from when I left the East Coast, man. Yeah. Now we're back at it. Uh, but so my two platoons got when we deployed got stuck doing a detail, and then. I ended up as a, you know, task unit with no platoon. So I ended up getting a platoon from Team 10 for a month. Then huh. they went and picked up a detail. And then I got a platoon from Team 4, which was awesome. It was Danny Marshall was the platoon chief, stud. Uh, was, that was Eddie Byers' platoon. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a cool deployment, man. It was, uh, you know, I had Heil and myself, Johnny Walker, uh, Anthony Baker was the commander. And... Uh, just the, our mission really was to make sure uh it was dignitary protection on the backside so yeah. it was anybody who was targeting uh the fi- the top 5 in Iraq were we we could we were cleared hot to go target target them and so we were uh you know just taking down al qaeda cells just going out as much as we could to uh and we did good we we hit a you know we we did uh some damage to some of the cells there kind of really interesting it was a trippy period of time there uh we rolled up this whole cell uh, over a course of a few operations and uh they were like the first dudes to go on trial in the court system oh really in iraq yeah so our how'd guys that, were like testifying how'd that work out for them uh they yeah they were <laughs> sentenced to uh death or oh, lo- and uh but one of the the head guy we got that, that started this whole thing uh, right before he redeployed, he he escaped Abu Ghraib, man. Somebody bribed like five thousand bucks, and that son of a bitch. I don't know what happened. He probably got killed. Uh, I hope so. He I hope was, so as well. He was uh, weird. It, it was kind of surreal. I mean, I would, I wouldn't call it interrogations, but I spent a lot of time one on one with the guy. Yeah, talking to him, and he was just. It, it was just you've never just evil like that. They, it, it's it's beyond Western comprehension. In that he was like telling me about all the heads he had cut off, uh, you know, all the attacks. And they're all verified, you know, so it's like th- this guy's, like, legit. And uh, his parting words to me before he went to uh, trial was like, you know, he's like, you're an honorable man, you know. If I ever captured you, I'd, I'd put a bullet in your head instead of cutting your neck. I'm like, thank you. Well, gee, thanks, you know. I, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. is it dusty in here? Yeah. <laughs> like, fucking shoot that fucker, you know. <laughs> The damn rule of law got in the way in that one. That's experiencing those individuals. I would I would put in the same level of trying to describe a DMT trip. Yeah, oh, it, yeah absolutely. It exceeds in my in my limited vocabulary my ability to describe it. Totally. If yeah. you if it's just it's beyond again our, our comprehension. It's, it's and evil. people will push back against that. They're like, "There's no way." It's like I. I'm conflicted because what I really wish is I could leave you alone in a room for, with that guy for a bit, yeah. but I don't want to because he would fucking murder you. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't matter if you, it doesn't matter. He is the exact opposite of what you are, and it's not going to go your way. And I'm, I don't know. It's a tough one for people to understand. It is, and I mean, you know, there, that's a small percent. Smet, excuse me, fucking burp. Ah, uh, yeah. It, there's not a ton of people like that. I think most people in like in Iraq. They just want to get on with their lives, man. They just yep. want to live, and, and you know, like Anbar, right? I mean, it was a, it was a sales pitch, you know. And they bought the Al Qaeda version as being less painful than the American version at first, and then, you know, 2006 rolled around the surge and a very well executed counterinsurgency plan that you know Jock and those cats had a hand in, and a slew of other people. Uh, you know, also now the. Uh, our side looked a little bit more appealing to the buyers, which were all the residents there. I mean, all, yeah. people just want to be safe. They want their kids to be able to go to school and have food and water and power. You see it in Afghanistan, too, or yeah. in, in anywhere where it's tribal. They're looking at what's the, the – both of these options probably suck, but what's the lesser of two evils totally. that at least allows me to live my life? Yeah. I get that. Yeah. You're picking – You know, do I want to get whipped with a, you know, a ball and chain or do I want to get beaten with a stick? Yeah. It's – yeah, I mean, and U.S. track record's terrible. I mean, it's like our foreign yeah. policy is seduction followed by abandonment, you know? Like, look at the Kurds. I mean, that might actually be in doctrine somewhere. With seduction? Chapter two. <laughs> seduction followed by abandonment. <laughs> Promise all this stuff, get them all liquored up, and then dip out of there. And, and You guys got this? Cool. Peace. We're, yeah. No, it's, I, it's terrible. Fuck, man. It, 
history is not, I don't think, going to judge our performance very highly. No. In either OEF or OIF. Uh uh-uh. uh. And, it's and, and it shouldn't. No. Yeah. But it's, those are, I mean, you just think back, like, God damn. Just uh, 2003, we had this window of opportunity to really get, I mean, everybody in Iraq, like, if you, if you ever get a chance to talk to, like, or read Johnny Walker's book about, uh, yeah, I mean, the story after he met us, we all know, but uh, what I found really fascinating was his opinion of Iraq, you know, growing Pre-invasion. up. Pre-invasion. Yeah, yeah, and growing up with that. And you're getting a perspective of a, a Sunni dude who's married to a Shia gal and uh, in Mosul. And and so you get a really unique perspective of what Iraq was like. And so when you – and that's what – it almost made me more frustrated uh, knowing that because we had – you know, 2003, early in 2003, we had this opportunity to get things right. Yeah. And what do we do? You know, well, get rid of all the dick. Ba'ath Party. Uh, you know, we alienated the Sunni population quite a bit. And created an, a, vacuum. Provi- a vacuum. We literally provided the, the space for that vacuum to exist. Yeah, I mean, I can't, like, you know, how many of the targets we hit were like, this guy was a former Ba'ath Party member. Okay, so all the corporate knowledge on how to run the power, how to, you know, just the, the bureaucracy, we disbanded. And people who have been living in fear now are expected to figure that shit out. No way. It's a tough cookie to crack. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, if you, so you probably made nine off or after that tour. I did. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, we got back in two thousand uh, end of two thousand five, and uh, then I went over to PTRR, and then first phase did a year each, and I made it uh, right when I got the first phase. Is yeah. when I put on nine. And then where to go after that? Uh, did that la- did that year at first phase? Went to team one. Yep. Did uh, with Ke- Kevin James, man. CMC. Yeah, Keith Davids was the uh, CEO, man. That was awesome. And then uh, Babin Leif was there. Yep. He was ops. And uh, so I was ops there. Babin's got a voice for fucking radio. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love him. Yeah, he, he's but funny. He's though. got one of the most unique voices. He's funny as shit. Yeah, he's just like chewing on gravel all the time. Apparently, just, yeah. Ah. <laughs> it, it was. I, I loved uh, working with him. He and I were like the ops combo in uh, Soda yeah. West in Iraq. And uh, well, it, it was kind of a that was a cool deployment too. One because uh, it was so different than uh, Ramadi in two thousand nine was so different oh, yeah. than Ramadi in two thousand four, five, and oh, six. Oh god, yeah. And and it was a trip. And it was cool having. Uh, Leif, as he was the ops officer, I was the CMC, and it was, it was cool having his perspective of it and uh, the way things were, you know, coming from Bruiser and then to uh, this role. But uh, yeah, it was a trippy deployment. Like the first month, uh, Ryan Job unfortunately had passed away, yeah. and then surgical complications, right? It was, yeah. yeah. And then the same time, uh, you know, that the start of that deployment, I'm sitting here like this, you know, you're Dan Canas and I'm me, and it's like, all right, Master Chief, yeah, we're taking off today. Like, cool, you know, take some scallops, have fun, yep. good luck, be safe. And then, like, you know, two, three days later, I'm sitting in my same desk getting ready for next wave of people to deploy. And it's like he stepped on a mine. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck. And so we started the deployment with, you know, Dan getting wounded bad, not knowing if he's going to make it or not. And then uh, Ryan passing away. And so uh, Kevin stayed back with Dan and, and, and Leif, uh, you know, helping take care of Ryan's family for that first month. And, yeah. and so it was a, it was a kind of a, a goofy start to the deployment. And then, uh, and then Leif got back out there and we, we could kind of hit it on all cylinders, but it was a cool deployment. I mean, yeah, I had the election go on and that was really the focus and the biggest V bit I've ever seen in my life cracked off on uh, the Ramadi bridge one day. That was pretty rad. How many pounds? V- vehicle born ex- uh, IED. It was like a, it had to be like 10,000 or something. It was like a whole, oh, shit. It, the truck was full. Yeah, it was, uh, and it was nobody, small, small nuclear bomb. Nobody got killed. It was, uh, it was like a separatist, bath, bathist uh, separatist group. They huh. parked the truck on the bridge, dipped out of there, clacked it and clacked it off. But, uh, <laughs> so you know where shark, you've been shark base, yeah. right? Yeah. So at the bridge right there, uh, our, our building was like the fifth palace down. The front door, it was like thick oak like that. It turned to splinters. Wow. It just, it was, everybody's walking around with big bug eyes and it was, <laughs> it was so big. Cause Leif was like, cause Leif came in laughing. He's like, man, I'll stand outside and knock me flat on my ass. Just, oh, I'm sure it boom. did. It was huge. Yeah. That much explosive. It's like, I mean, if you're in close proximity, might as well be a goddamn nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Mushroom cloud and all. All the computers are fucked up from oh, all the dust sure. that blew everywhere. And, <laughs> 
It was that was epic, but uh, and then uh, after that, he climbed the E nine tree. Yeah, I did uh, CMC at uh, so I rolled into the CMC seat after that deployment. We did uh, went to UAE for that deployment. It was kind of short fuse. That was a kludge, and we had the uh, the team pulled out, focused on two platoons, focused on the Philippines. Yep, uh, shutting down Iraq and then standing things up in the UAE. How uh, much did you see the teams change in your twenty seven years? Uh, in terms of like tactics and mindset, uh, immensely. I mean, it just it, it, it evolved. Not mindset, but uh, tactics for sure. Tactics and gear. rapidly. Yeah, I mean, and just in the incorporation of technology. You know, whereas you know in the early nineties, like, you don't need nods. Fuck that. You know, why would you want to see it night? Exactly. You know, it's that kind of mindset. And then, and it was all based around pussy. Yeah. Like, oh, you want to see at night? Yeah. You're a pussy. Yeah. Just, I'm going to wear swim goggles so I can't see shit because I'm hard. Because I'm a Jedi. <laughs> yeah. I'll just use a force. No, it's because harder was better. Yeah, no, it's yeah. nuts, man. And uh, Body armor? You're going to wear body armor on patrol? Yeah. Pussy. Weak. <laughs> Why the hell are you doing that? I mean, yeah. I think about like, okay, so 93, first yeah. deployment, we roll into Cairo West on October 2nd, spend the night until October 3rd, 1993. And the place is in pandemonium because uh, all that shit's going down in Mogadishu. And there's planes flying from Cairo West down to Somalia. And I, I think about like, hey, if, of course, we were like, let's go. We want to go. I think about that. We would have like fast roped into there with no body armor, you know, floppy hats, desert camp. I mean, no helmets. No, nothing. Probably didn't even have med kits on you. Yeah. Well, no, you had the, that plastic one. <laughs> That's you what I'm get, just yeah, dog shit. Some band aids. Yeah. yeah. No, it would have been terrible. A shit show. And I think about like, like, like you talked to like Rick Kaiser and, and, uh, or Howie or whomever was, uh, on that, you know, from the command that was on that op and yep. like the lessons learned. I mean, I think about, you know, those grenade pit Humvees we had, you know, that was a, byproduct of that nods always have your nods on you you know yep. just a slew of things but uh i think really obviously you know you evolve and the tactics just change immensely but our reliance also on you know accepting technology and accepting people that are good at technology into the fold and taking them on the target it's not just all seals and it's a fine line too between acceptance of technology and reliance upon technology. oh yeah totally Yep. Because if you go too far into the reliance and your skill set diminishes, yeah, that's not getting you any farther down the road either. No, it's not. You know. Yeah, the core. I mean, again, people ask me like, "What do you need to know to be a seal?" Shoot, move, and communicate. I mean, that's, totally. that's a super broad answer, and you could go into each and every one of those things. Yeah. But as long as you are at all times sharpening that blade, yeah, you're probably going to be okay. Totally. You know, it, it's. Yep. Yeah, there's there's a balance uh, between. I mean, you see it in everyday life. Like, if you were to take somebody's cell phone away from them, it would be worse than losing a family member. A catastrophic failure in uh, their ability to conduct life in society, I let mean, alone business. Uh, completely, man. And, and if you get to that spot, I would just recommend maybe consider how uh, dangerous that may be. Yeah, that's you know, terrible. Or how much you're relying upon that stuff. I will say, like, uh, in terms of the people, I think the it's the same kind of core values guys have. But I think the younger guys are way more open-minded than, uh, and it's just a generational thing, yeah. right? So like when the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, and there was like this huge script, the CMC and CO had to go through and it followed to the letter. Right. And so if you, you got like, you know, I remember having to, you know, present it to the, all the platoons and they're just sitting there like, yeah, who cares? He's gay. You know, like it, it wasn't a, like the the military and the media made it such a production out of yeah. it. And it was again, more it, of a production for people who weren't even in the military than it was for those that were. Because nobody cared. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and that's why I, I love the one thing I really liked about the military. It's a pure meritocracy. You know, like, I mean, there, there, yes, there in the past has there been sexism and racism and, and homophobia. Absolutely. But yeah. if I look at it, you know, for the bulk of my career, it was do your job and do it well, I'm judging you on your character and your actions, and that's it. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's not to say, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't issues. But there always will be. We're talking about people. Yeah, it's a human condition, man. Everybody's different, and everybody's yeah. going to have When did thing. the, uh, I was asking somebody about this the other day, and I didn't know the answer, and neither did they. When was the SEAL ethos created? That was, uh... I just remember it kind of, like, being there. 2004. Okay. Yeah, those guys like uh, Bill Wilson and uh, 
a slew of senior leaders went out to the island and I think it was 2004. Put it together? Yeah. What do you think about them changing it to be gender neutral? I mean, are we that, sh- you know, the intent of it. I mean, I, I just, the political correctness thing needs yeah. to stop. It's, that's not, if, if you are that offended by a man and a woman, which is, I mean, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard since it's a Latin term for let it be or whatever it means, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, but that, if that offends you, you, you're, you're, I don't know, you're, you're kind of worthless. <laughs> Fair. I mean, I don't know. It's like I mean, you and I grew up without the sea ethos, and the reason yeah. I asked about it is I think it was a step in the right direction. And, and having an ethos, absolutely. And people have to understand this too. Your company can have an ethos, or you could have you know, the SEAL community has an ethos. It doesn't actually mean shit. It's your yeah. it's your adherence to the ethos that actually matters. Yeah. But I mean, you and I grew up in an era where there there wasn't a SEAL ethos on paper. Right. I would say that there was, but it was passed down. Honestly, through some of the hazing stuff, through sure. the suffrage, through the it, through the senior leaders passing on that knowledge, I think they did a, a good thing by committing it to paper and yeah. starting that with a broad approach super early on. Yeah, I, I like, like it. In bud, so they are they know what they're getting themselves into, and it's a great standard to hold. I mean, read through it. There's nothing in there that's like it's what you and I were taught. Yeah, it just it wasn't committed to paper. At that man, point. the pushback people some guys gave on it was kind of ridiculous and yeah what was it based on what was, i mean what was the argument against it i don't know I, it, it, there wasn't really one i mean how do you argue against those kind of values right because you're team guys you argue against change of any kind that, that is true yeah <laughs> nah, you gotta, uh... what you're changing something that we've done before but i can't tell you why we do it fuck you we're not changing that <laughs> yeah 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 and they, I mean, they might have rolled it out the wrong way. I don't know. I don't really. I don't remember the rollout. I don't remember the rollout either. It just seemed to like be there one day. I was like, yeah. well, I guess we have an ethos. But it, you know, as as I got older, I, I appreciate it more, and it's a great point of departure. Like you did not live up to this. Well, from an administrative perspective, at the E nine level, where you're considering taking somebody's bird, or it, yeah, I mean, that does make it easier. It's a concrete example Completely. of where you fell short. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I liked it, and then. Uh, yeah, so after Team 1, I went to uh, Group 1 as the Ops Master Chief, and then we had a situation with E9s and video games and books, and uh, so I ended up dual-hatting uh, Ops and CMC at Trade At. That was with, an interesting situation that s- it slammed quite a few people. Oh, that was, cr- yeah, that was nuts. Yeah. And it was weird uh, having to sit on a DRB for your role models, you know, and some of those guys. Uh, what was a uh, obviously you don't have to go into names or specifics, but I'm trying to. What was the majority of the punishment that was handed out from that? I think just drop your papers. Yeah, meaning yeah. you know we're not going to we're not going to kick you out right now, but you, this is your last enlistment type thing. Yeah, yeah, that's not the I way to go out after those no. storied careers. Oh, completely, for some of those individuals. Man. Yeah, I mean, like I said, lo- those guys were, you know, a couple of those guys were guys I remember, you know, as a new E five E six, really looking up to, and, and yeah, and I still do. I mean, it's like you made a mistake. And, there was, and and I don't want to get into too much detail about the whole thing, but I think a lot of that stemmed from the fact that the military really couldn't go after the one person they probably wanted to. Oh, 100%. So they started looking at the people who were associated and by proxy. Yeah. I mean, they basically, I mean, I get it, right? Yeah. Is there any reason to kill a fly with a hammer? No, but if you do, the other flies might pay attention. Yeah, and that's what happened. It's exactly what happened. Yeah. And some people... With careers that are fucking legendary, totally got shown the door, um, and again, it does remove the decisions that they made, and yeah. and I know some of them very well, and you know when they're at that level, should they know the rules that they are at least bending, sometimes breaking? Yes. Yeah. Did any of them really have an intent to do that? Not really. They kind of were going along with what they had gotten away with in the past. Yeah, right. But and, what they had gotten away with in the past was slightly outside of uh, published doctrine. Yeah. So therefore, that stand was, by. That sucked. That was painful. Yeah. But yeah, so I ended up doing that and then uh, went over to Warcom and was ops there with uh, Gary Richard was the uh, ops officer. And then he and I tag teamed uh, group one. Yep. And uh, that was fun. That was a cool job. And that was your last group one was your last tour? Yep. Yeah, I got out just in time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah. Yes. Dodge that bullet. Fuck. Sorry, man. Steve. <laughs> but how do you think the. Uh... How much of a blow to the SEAL teams was the publicity that has come out in the last, call it five years? I, 
I mean, from an operational perspective, I don't think it has any impact on the guy's ability on target. No. But I think it might have some impact on actually getting them to the target. Yeah, I just we should be in the shadows, man. Like, just be a quiet professional. I mean, that was instilled in us in day one. And, yeah. like, any of that stuff, it just undermines everything. And, you know, it's we're small enough that it, it's always been a challenge with the big green machine, right? And so... You know, we have to be that much better on terms of behavior and ethics and values and stuff. Otherwise, it kind of undermines us. And yeah. uh, right or wrong, you know, we have a reputation with them and the books and the publicity and the stupid shit. Uh, it's not helping anything. It doesn't help it. You know, and I thought we, you know, it was really pro- like we're talking about. It was really parochial in the 90s, I felt. Uh, and then war happens. And you realize, like, we're all brothers here, man. And, you know, you got strengths, we got strengths, you got weaknesses, we got weaknesses, but, like, you guys are my bros, and we're all in this thing together. And then, uh, and that was really cool, and I felt like some of these stupid incidents undermined all that hard work to put that behind us, and, yeah. you know, and that that's frustrating because there shouldn't be any parochialism, man, <laughs> you, you know? And, well, it's easy to do... Well, if you don't have an enemy, I've said this before, you know, when, when the SEAL community doesn't have an enemy, all we do is we fight each other. Totally. So yeah. it's the same thing, military services or branches. Like when we absent pre-9-11, yeah. fuck, we, we might as well target ourselves or our brothers in arms and this or that. Right. And yeah. then you get to the place where you're forced to work together and you get to know the people. Like when I went down and uh, did that last deployment with uh, the Army guys at Bragg, yeah. like at the at the operator level, Total. They're the exact same people. They get. They went to a different recruiter. Yes, and and it's like at that level, we instantaneously like you could link up because it's you're just the same person. Yeah, totally. And I asked them like, why why are people always saying like we don't get along? And they're like, well, I mean, probably from a generation past, and maybe at the higher levels where they're arguing over budget or you know relevance or whatever the fuck they're arguing over. But at an operator level, I was just like, oh, these guys are my boys. Like this is exactly the same thing. Totally at D nine level, I thought there was like some of the. You know, I had a buddy up in uh, the guy who ran first group while I was running group one. The guy's rad as hell, man. Yeah. Yeah, Shane Shorter, man. The guy's cool. Yeah. You know, so, I, I loved hanging out with him. And he and I would, you know, get stuck going over to SOC Corps for a conference or whatever. It's like I'm, you know, Caribbean or into him because yep. we were going to have fun. How was it uh, getting out for you? It's good. You know, like, uh, again, it was, I made the decision. And I'm not going to, I wasn't going to second guess it and it was time to go. Well, and you were also probably looking at the future before you got out. I mean, how much of your education did you knock out while you were still in? Uh, I had my bachelor's degree done. Uh, I think I wrapped it up like early 2009. So I had my bachelor's degree done. And uh, and so that was kind of nice. And then, you know, you do go through the Honor Foundation, which kind of gives you a, a little warm and fuzzy about the opportunities. That's optional, right? For guys to yeah, find it on is. their own. But yeah. it, it's smart to do it because. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I was, uh, you mean the TAPS program didn't prepare you for the next? It did. I learned, <laughs> I, I learned a little bit about the VA disability rating, and that's yeah, about it. Fuck. That was horrible. And uh, <laughs> so uh, Jason Torrey and I, JT and I, were going through the class, and uh, we were sitting through a resume class. I'm just like, fuck this, bro. Like we're, uh, like, we're looking at each other like, I don't want to go work for anybody. So I started a business. So we started a uh, kind of he's he's really well educated i mean he just wrapped up his phd in strategic leadership but he had an mba and a master's uh, as well so he had an mba and a master's in leadership uh and you know i'm coming off doing a group you know match com tour yep i'm like let's start a uh leadership kind of consulting and really uh you know, focus on, you know, just leadership and culture. And, and you know, I mean, Jocko, it's at the, the kind of the groundwork for some of that stuff. But it really interested me because we're both really passionate about it because you see uh, just the how good, like, you can take the bad news bears and make them a fantastic, high-performing team with good leadership. Or you can take the best operators in the world and just – Auger f- them into the fucking fuck ground. Yeah, man. And so we're, you know, and that it's fresh in our minds. So we started doing that. And, uh, you know, I had customers and we're doing, like, speaking, and, and which was fun. Uh, yeah, but then we, yeah, we, you and I had texted back and forth about that, uh, just speaking, uh, just oh, an yeah. occasion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I enjoy it because one, one, I'm a little bit on the introvert side. Yeah, and uh, so like getting up and telling the story, whether it's a leadership one or like when Johnny and I get up and talk, uh, you know, it's fun. 
but like I need to decompress after that for like just stay the fuck away from me for an hour. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna sit here, have a cup of coffee, and just like don't talk to me. I don't want to be around anybody. Uh, we, you know, for uh, a couple guys we knew had a venture fund with some really high net worth uh, global business leaders that they wanted us to put a guns and shit event on. You know, yeah, Sims and run through the house. Team and, guy for a day. Yeah, so we got Taco and and uh, a couple other dudes and. Uh, we, Did Taco give himself his nickname? Um, no way. He might have, though. Can you still call him Taco in 2021? It's getting it, no, considered it's t- slightly racist. It's totally, yeah. <laughs> but if he calls himself it. You know. I was going to say, he introduces himself as Taco. Yeah, so totally. I don't know what to do. I'm lost in the uh, yeah, modern know, huh? rules. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, it's uh, foreign to me. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> yeah, he's my brother. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, and so we ran this event, and we uh, one of, two of the participants there was a guy named uh, Gio Coglatore, and uh, and one of the yeah, and he had a company uh, called Our Store, and then one of the guys was uh, one of his board members, Chris, who was uh, used to be the head of sales at Cisco, kind of a small company, and uh, JT and Gio really hit it off well, and then and, and Gio just he's like, hey man, this was really impactful. I'd like you guys to come out to my company and take a look at it, and uh, you know help coach me, and he was like, okay, yeah. cool. And like Gio's the most humble dude I've ever met, uh, you know, immigrant from Sicily, came over with his grandparents, uh, you know, good blue collar background, but but brilliant. Like I'll look at that and see a blue curtain. He'll look at that and see these shapes and patterns that are gonna, you know, lead to a really cool end state that nobody in the world's gonna see. And so he had multiple successful uh, companies and exits, and really helped. Uh, build out uh like aws and google and allowed all those you know facebook yahoo all those places the hyperscale Mm -hmm. and uh and so he had a new company called our store and he he, come on out and so he did we started going out like one or two days a month and then it was a week a month and then two weeks a month and then last november he's like hey you two just put the business on side uh you're gonna come on full time and so we came on full time in kind of an executive role for the company and uh, we have, and then we have a sister company as well called Scilabs, and uh, that they spun out a few years ago. And uh, the founder and owner, majority owner of that, uh, decided to move on to different, you know, greener pastures, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so uh, G bought uh, him out, and goes, "All right, man, you know, your master's thesis was on uh, SEAL teams in Silicon Valley." <laughs> you, you, you're the CEO now. I'm Step like, up to the batter's box. <laughs> yeah. So he, he threw me in the seat last April. Yeah. Uh, into the CEO seat of a tech company, <laughs> and and not just like <laughs> it's not like like tech. Te- I mean, it's like uh, yeah. What do they do? What do you? Guys it's contain. Uh, contain. It's called a container. Singularity container. So it's a container's a, uh, you know, it's a software developing, but it's uh kind of isolates applications or IP things you're working on. You can share it across. Control access, but shared across multiple computers. And so is it it's kind of security based? I would 100% say. Oh, hundred percent security based. Like so, like one of the you know the lead software architect, uh, you know Canadian dude, uh, Adam, brilliant. Uh, his background's in the Five Eyes, uh, in, Intel communities, doing you know yeah. cybersecurity realm, and uh, so yeah, and so it's uh, you have a complete knuckle dragging Neanderthal CEO and like dudes who are just insanely smart. And, uh, They're it's, exhausted it's, by what I would describe as your and I's equal level of idiocy. Completely. They're probably just like, God damn it, now I have to go explain it to this moron again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. And I think the, like the first week I'm like, bro, like, I, and I, I still struggle explaining. I'm like, I, what you guys do, how am I going to get up to speed? And he goes like, hey, man, you're not here. Like, we yep. got the tech. You just lead. I'm like, wow, man, like that, no shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the theory behind it. We were talking about this yesterday, yeah. that leadership should be able to transcend the business category. Totally. And, you know, so many things I've seen in all the leadership roles in the SEAL community, it's the exact same stuff in the private sector. Yeah. I mean, like, the one thing I got to watch is my mouth, uh, you know, the language and F-bombs. I mean, that the kind of stuff. But that, that that's happy to glad shit, you know? like Yeah, and, you, the, and that's the, a very easily learnable skill it is yeah it takes a little bit of discipline on that yeah especially for a guy like me but uh it's 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 the same stuff man and it, it i have an absolute blast i love yeah. it and the guys are i mean like they work their ass off and it's really cool to uh 
one, it, it, it was cool to be able to hop in that seat. And, and because I'm ignorant of it, uh, you know, it gave them an opportunity to innovate, right? Because if had I had I I'd known enough to be dangerous, I'd be like, "Well, let's do it this way." And, yeah. And with this, it's like you you guys are the experts. You know, you tell me what you think is right looks like. I'll ask a bunch of dumb questions that you should be able to answer. Because uh, if not, then maybe rethink it. But now you can innovate a little bit and come yeah. up with some new stuff, and 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 that makes it really exciting that, uh, you know, that we we're able to. Uh, kind of almost double our ARR, uh, you know, annual revenue, recurring revenue, uh, and then c- start road mapping some and developing some new stuff that is going to be disruptive as hell. And it's going to be really cool. And it's got a, a bunch of really unique use cases. Like right now, we're kind of uh, the current product sets in uh, like high performance computing centers, a uh, lot in academia. Uh, and so basically, a- show people a bunch of a fucking moron I am. It just isolates so nobody else can have access to it. So you have all these individual tranches basically. Yeah, or you can grant the access to okay. you know, control the access points. But uh, you know, it's uh like we're installed in like the largest supercomputers in the world and that sort of thing. But now we're shifting. Yeah. We're, we're always maintaining that and then shift over to some some newer innovative stuff. Before um, you landed at the job now when you would talk to people about leadership, whether it's yeah. individuals or organizations, how was it received? Very well. And I think, yeah, it was good. I mean, and, and I, it was nice to get, uh, you know, thought-provoking, challenging assumption type questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think it was, it was, yeah, generally really well received. And, and I've done it uh, on my own, talking about, and a lot of times I'll just go through my kind of life story and the lessons I've learned. Yeah. Uh, and then I've done it with uh, JT and myself. Like we did a, a big thing in Vegas to, uh, you know, a, an association of like professional precision manufacturers, and it was uh, it was cool. You know, it's uh, you know, he scripted, it and you know, JT has his own unique perception on certain things. I got my own experiences, and mm-hmm. and you just kind of marry the two together, and that's what we did with the company, and we still do that now. Actually, I mean, even though we're on the payroll, it's you know, we kind of tag team a lot of the stuff. Yeah, you know. it's uh, it's just my foot. Huh. I was uh. I've spoken to quite a few organizations and my message on leadership is, is very simple Yeah, because I, I mean, effective leadership is hopefully very simple because you want to mess up a good plan, make it complex. Yeah. In my opinion. Oh, totally. Yeah. But it's been amazing to me in talking to fortune 500 companies, fortune 100 companies, fortune 50 companies that some of this stuff, when it comes to leadership, just very, you know, empower your people talking about accountability. Yeah clear and concise guidance like you know don't overwhelm your people but give them boundaries right they can they it's it, maybe it's not the first time that they're hearing it but they haven't heard it that much it's yeah. shocking to me it is you know it, it is and uh yeah I, I have to i haven't done one in a while and i should i'd like to you know one of these times i have to pull it up and because re- it's good to revisit you know like uh one of the things we would talk about is uh well one you know, like the like how do you recruit talent Yep. You know, and uh, and then one of the things I like because you see it so often is uh, passion versus emotion, and I'm guilty as hell of it too. I mean, I get emotional on things, and that's a bad decision. Yeah. But you would see it at work all the time, and you see it, you know, in the private sector is, uh, you know, that passionate leader is. I, I kind of say like the passionate leader likes the problem and is open to all solutions to solving it, whereas the emotional one you know, is in love with the solution and it's theirs. Yeah, because they want to own the fix. Yeah, and you, I've seen that time and time again. The teams, it fucks stuff up. For sure. And you see it in the private sector too. But uh, yeah, it's really, uh, it's cool. Like I diving into something like this, you know, I, like I said, in the start, like I got out to become uncomfortable. I was too comfortable. So like- Sounds jumping, like you got what you're looking for. In spades, <laughs> man. Like, uh, you know, it's like, I can't think of anything that's going to make you more uncomfortable than that. Yeah, for sure. For me, at least. But it's fun. Yeah, I don't know if anything would make me more uncomfortable than trying to get a job in the tech industry. Yeah, it's a weird environment. But I like, like it. I, I can be an end user, but whew, man, I don't know if I'm ready for it, behind the curtain It there. is shockingly similar to the teams in in the, I mean, just take the, you know, instead of a bunch of tattooed knuckle draggers, you have a bunch of really smart dudes. And, uh, you know, and uh, it's uh, the same kind of just get shit done. You know, yeah. I don't, you know, don't worry about the title. 
work, you know, you wear multiple hats, get things done, fill in the gaps. There's a gap, fill it. Uh, ambiguous environment at times. You come in in the morning and you're going to be out of business by noon and then by one o'clock in the afternoon you're going to turn into a freaking unicorn <laughs> and you're going to be millionaires. <laughs> and it's it's just like, it's a complete emotional roller yeah. coaster, but if you let it. it yeah. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. Yeah. It's how do you handle those stress yeah. and, and uh, to stop, take a knee, look at things, make a smart decision or yeah. make a decision and then move forward with it and make the course corrections. Yeah, I couldn't fun, agree though. more. What was your... Uh, when you look back at your time in the teams, what was your favorite training blocks? Because I could tell you my least favorite. I, uh, you know, certain th- there's certain there wasn't like I loved doing it this time. Uh, it was a specific time. So like, yeah, uh, doing Mar Ops and Kodiak Marine Operations. We used, oh, first off, fuck you. That, what you're talking about is small boats. Yeah, in, in Kodiak, seas. Alaska, in Big Sea. That was terrifying. Hard pass. That was, that, but it's cool because you, you, when you lived, correct. And, and then uh, I loved. It was not cool during. No, it's it was <laughs> it was terrifying. Uh, I loved going out to Marana and jumping. Same. Uh, I loved doing. Uh, underways and big seas i thought that was cool uh you know and it just i guess training wise uh you know like when we first got the teams some of the uh just brutal combat swimmer dives you know like the uh it's not because it was fun it, it, it was because it sucked but like you know over the beach turtle back across the freaking bay double ship attack turtle back back swim back over the beach you know and then sleep. call it a day yeah and sleep for the next two days yeah. Uh, like those kind of things were cool. Like stuff that no shit pushed you to the mental and physical limit of your endurance. And then a couple steps past that where you really had to keep your wits about you. Yeah. Uh, those kind of training evolutions I liked. And I, I, you could find that in jumping. You could find that in mar ops. You could find that in diving. You could find it in, you know, Wherever. urban. So um, turtle backing is so what Jason's talking about. Sucks. Closed circuit diving, which would be when you're underwater. You have a limited amount of oxygen or scrubber. You're going to bump yeah. up against the, the limits of both, hopefully not simultaneously. So to save oxygen, you will inflate your life jacket just a little bit, and you face the wrong direction. Yeah. So your back is towards where you're going, and you surface swim. Hours. Hours. Sucks. Only to get to a point where you then go on bag, which is the procedure of purging for the yeah. LAR-5. And then you go underwater, the double ship attack, meaning – Probably hit some reset points along the way, a hole of the vessel, go back to the propellers likely, the struts. Yeah. Go to another one, propellers, struts. Yeah. Swim underwater. Back to you're probably that's definitely a dead reckoning leg where you just got your it's compass. Horrible. Yeah, and you're yeah. And then you come back up and you have to turtle back again that entire distance you already did. And it's brutal. It's brutal. And, and the, you're not moving quickly. No, and the way in, you have to be on a time you're on a timeline, man. Yeah. So you can't lollygag because those currents change every 20 minutes. Yep. And so you got, I mean, that, that, that I did like that about like more ops, like that, the planning it out. The like, precision and complexity. Yeah. yeah and it's w- a lot more difficult than just throwing on dive. And yeah. when you hit it, according to your plan, that is a good feeling. Like you feel like you accomplished something. I remember doing dives like that where we would be planning the tide, you know, where we would want to turtle back in yep. as the tide was what would be flowing. So coming in because we were making and heading towards the ship and oh, yeah. do all of our shipboard stuff. Yeah. So then we could catch it when the tide was ebbing out. Right. And, so, and it was amazing you know, because you could stop kicking It's shallower areas, like over by the golf course, you know, yeah. where you could stop kicking or as you were getting to that, you're just getting pulled along. Yeah. My God, I am the smartest man in the world. I know. That's such a good feeling. And but- then there's times where you don't time it and you're kicking as hard as you can you're like i'm not moving when you get so lost under those bo- boats man like you just there's there's no greater frustration and then you, you know you're you and your die buddy are punching each other underwater and but i've had some very sucks. complicated and in deep conversations with people on drager and i feel like we were effectively communicating yeah yeah. It, it just being able to understand what that noise meant and a lot of like, <laughs> like yeah. it's just like, or just like punch them right in the mouth. Oh, yeah. Just rip their ding. mask off a bit. <laughs> asshole. Yeah. It was, uh, those I, were cool. I like the fact that it was constantly shifting. Yeah. The most consistent training I think I ever did was on the East Coast because it was so targeted towards that the MST and clearance. Oh, completely. And then we would layer other stuff like vehicles or boats or helicopters and all that. Yeah. But I love the fact that as an occupation, 
for 18 months working up to it, it's like you're going to go do cool shit in the desert. Yeah. And then, okay, we, well, then we're going to go to Kodiak, the more ups. And then we're going to dive and jump. And I just love the fact. Variety. It was the variety. Yeah. And most of the evolutions, obviously the dive that we were talking about with the turtle back, that would be towards the tail end. You don't do that on the first no, day you, because you, it's somebody's first combat swimmer course. Yeah. And somebody else's 15th. So you build into it in that crawl, walk, run. And towards the end, I mean, I remember some of the evolutions. I was augmenting or helping out the team as they were going through. Uh, Jock was still the OIC of trade at the time. Some of the FTXs, yeah, f- so final or field training exercises, and they were ridiculously complex. Oh yeah, Jock with, had some with problem sets before and after. It wasn't just about hey, you know, this mock village that we would set up, but you were going to get challenged on the way there, and then, then on target, and then on the way back, and a combination of all that stuff. And yeah, I enjoyed that for it, sure. Yeah, he did a gr- fantastic job. I mean, that really upped. I think everybody's game. Yeah, it, just the mindset he took to it. My hats off to him for that. I mean, that was. Uh, you're right. I mean, there was, there was at no point where you could get comfortable and rest on your look because you're gonna you get could. injected. Yeah, you're gonna get smashed. <laughs> you're gonna get you know utterly smashed and sit there looking up like what what the fuck just happened in my I life. I think it was uh, a fratty. Yeah, I was tasking a chief though, so it was before Jocko yeah. was. He's. OIC. I'm gonna say right now, completely out of his goddamn mind. Uh, yeah, he was. In the best of ways. No, I'm he's like, yeah, rad, yeah. He, uh, we're doing like a task unit size IAD and everybody died but me. <laughs> so I was I had like 260s and running, trying to leapfrog myself back. It was pretty funny. I would he, just start taking off all of my gear and just run. <laughs> Jock, what do you, like, what, a, I don't know, I'm making uh, shit up. Everybody's dead. It's 120 <laughs> degrees outside. A Friday's got a cigarette, yeah. a cup of coffee, and a dip in his mouth. Ah! What do you have, uh, what do you got on your horizon for, I mean, you're just over the 50 mark, right? Yeah. So you're almost dead. I I'm mean, almost dead. as shit. I am. What do you have, uh, what do you have on your horizon for, say, five and ten years out? What are you looking uh, towards doing? You know, I'm so, like, front sight focused on, uh, you know, making what Skylabs right now. Yep. and our store succeed. But there's startups, and, you know, that's, you know, a two-year lifespan. So, uh, you know, after that, uh you know, depending on the success or the degree of success it has. Yeah, to give you options or yeah, not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind, but regardless of what happens, like it's some amazing lessons learned, right? So I, I now I have this background as leading in the SEAL teams, you know, as a, a CMC and, and as a CEO of a, a tech company. Uh, and I enjoy, you know, speaking and uh, and so I, you know, cap like you know, JT and and you know myself talked. We talked about like it may be cool to like write a book, but not a you know a seal book, but like mm-hmm. lessons learned and because we we got so many lessons learned about things we have you know dicked up you know in the last year or uh, done well, and so it's uh, a completely different perspective that'd be fun to capitalize on some way because it, there's some good lessons learned here that we've done yeah. and it's a unique. Uh, you know, we just I mean it's a unique place. There's not many guys who are team guys and then. Executives and tech companies. I mean, I know one. Yeah. But, I mean, you're sitting here, so. Yeah. You know, and JT is the other one. That's yeah. about it, you know? I don't have an issue with books written by SEALs as long as they are either – needs to be one of two things, like Jack Carr. Fiction books. Fuck, yeah. Go to town. He's awesome. Totally. Couldn't Because he's writing a fiction book. Yeah. My issue is when you have people who are trying to write nonfiction books, but it's full of fiction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have an issue with that. I do, too. And, uh, I mean, everybody has their own experiences, and they have the right to do what they want to with them. Sure. But I don't think that those books – and I actually had this conversation with Jack. He had a good point. He was like, well, what if those books pique an interest in people, and then they end up finding their way to the SEAL teams? It's like, okay, I can see that. Yeah. But I just hate people inflating and turning things that weren't into something that – was yeah. it bothers me at a very deep level i have an issue when it's they haven't done a whole lot of time in and then they're capitalizing on the brand name and there's guys who are still in slugging it out day in and day yeah. out and that that's well you me, could be in for a long time and not do shit not totally true we all know people who have made choices yeah that could from the outside be like oh you just got to run a bad card it's like, no you didn't yeah you made those choices totally and they, they can oftentimes get to high rank but just because you've been in I, the people that I run into, and they'll you know find out it's 
probably one of the last things that I ever want to tell people that I was a SEAL when I meet them. It's not like, yeah. hi, I'm Andy, the Navy SEAL. It's not like, hey, what's up? And yeah. when people ask me, oh, uh, you know, were you in the military? I was like, yeah, yeah I was. in the Navy. That's what I started. What you do in the Navy? I mean, yeah. And I will, I mean, I'll, if they stop asking questions there, perfect. Yeah, It's exactly. preferable for me because I don't have to talk about it. But then they'll find out that you were a SEAL and they're like, oh, man. And then they think the whole career is just bullets and bangs. And, no. and it's just everybody, every SEAL is you know, killing hundreds of people and they've all seen so much combat and it just couldn't be farther from the truth. No, totally. So that yeah. makes them so susceptible to those books that are full of shit. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah the spot on. Uh, yeah, I don't have any, again, my, my only issue is, like you said, is it, when the, taking a little bit of liberty with what they did or, and they don't have the depth and experience. I mean, to yeah. me, the, the team's experience is, is more than a couple deployments. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's being an instructor. It's being in a leadership role. It's seeing more than just the pure operational phase yeah. as, as an assaulter or an operator, whatever term you would want to use for yourself. Whole, yeah, the whole kind of gambit of the uh, experience. I think make, you know it's, it's yeah. good to see it. But uh, yeah, like I haven't. I mean, I love to write. It, I, it's one of the. It's something I've always enjoyed to do. But it, I've been jaded, I think, because of so many books and. And, I mean, uh, I mean, I heard that now when you graduate, Bud, you get a book deal on the spot. I mean, yeah. I heard it's contractual. They added to the ethos. So you are within four to six years of getting out required to write your memoirs. Write your, write your memoirs, yeah. Totally. I think it can be done properly. I think For Jocko's sure. books are a great example. Yeah, and he did it right because I remember yeah. when he was writing them, uh, you know, they got circulated – or I got to look at it, at least beforehand yeah, at Warcom. He pick and choose the right people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you do it the right way. When JW, who has no obligation whatsoever to uh, run it by Warcom, he took his, you know, we were out because I was helping him with his book a bit, and yeah. I got the right part of the prologue and shit, and uh, he circulated that through Warcom to get approval, make sure there's nothing in there that was gonna, yeah. and he had no, you know, obligation to do so. Yeah, and then you look at the guys who don't do that. I mean, here's an Iraqi interpreter. He's not even a citizen at that time yet. Yeah. Who's going through the, trying to do things the right way to do no adverse harm to the Trident and the Brotherhood and Sisterhood. People will hit me up to write, they'll ask why I haven't written a book. I had a blog for a while and I actually enjoy, I love writing, but yeah. it takes me a little bit of time and this medium is more convenient and you can unpack so much deeper because God yeah. forbid. You write something in black and white and hit oh, yeah. post. People are like, well, you, your tone in that sucks. I'm like, you brought that tone with you, douche. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. this is what you're talking about. Like, no, that's not. I'm like, fuck, it's such an incomplete medium. You know what I like doing was uh, when I was doing the uh, your your CrossFit Coronado Nutrition blog. Yeah. I got to write that. That was Yeah, fun. that's right. Yeah. yeah. That was good. I like that one. But that the was... book thing, I just sit there and I'm like, here would be the opening of my book. No shit. There, <laughs> there I was doing things that had been done by many before me yeah. and will have been done by many after the yeah. end. Like, yeah, right. what the fuck am I going to write? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> there, instead of there I was, you know, 25,000 yeah. feet with nothing but a silkworm and a sewing machine. Yeah. It, I, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Maybe one day I don't, I just, I don't think I have anything unique to offer specifically with my experience or yeah. more importantly from my, like my optic optic of how I view that career. There's people out there like Jocko's doing a great job of talking about leadership and oh totally. I mean, I personally believe he gets up a little bit too early in the morning, um, but whatever, do yeah, whatever you sure, want, man. Yeah, do I'm whatever not. you want to do. But it's like I don't, I why like, dude, I'll just point people in his direction. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day I will a coloring book, perhaps. That's yeah, that'd be good. I, it, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it'd be, I, I'd like to kind of do it, but I want to do something different, and I want to get. I, I don't know how I would make it different. I guess that's what I come back yeah, up against. Yeah, and, and that's why I'm in a position where it's going to be different because this experience JT and I are going through right now is completely yeah. different, S similar but different, and it's unique. And so you want to fresh it, – it's everything – you know, you don't want to do something that's been done before just trying to put a new spin on it. Like what Jocko did was different. Yeah. You know? I have considered creating the Navy SEAL cookbook series. Oh, I'd do that, man. Yeah, but the thing is, I would just, of course, put the trident on it somewhere so it sells, and then the yeah. recipes are completely normal. This is what team guys eat, man. You or know. you could do one with, like, you just get a box of MREs, and do each page would be a different five-course meal yeah, with an MRE. you'll never be able to keep up with the Rangers on that one, though, so don't even bother. No, it would be a total novelty and therefore a waste of time. But I eat lard and broccoli. Yeah, that's, that's my cookbook. Yeah, you have had... Uh, remember when we would work out together at the trade-up building, you... The fuck you were eating like tallow or something like that yeah pemmican i was making uh homemade pemmican so i take uh <laughs> i take beef heart make jerky out of it grind it into a powder and then mix it with uh melted tallow 
yeah, you offered me some one day, and I smelled it. I'm like, you can just it smells eat, like a cow. Eat a bag of dicks. I'm yeah. not eating any of that. <laughs> it's healthy. Wow. Man. Indians lived on it, man. Back on the plains. Yeah, well, we don't live on the plains anymore. We don't. I know. And so, <laughs> yeah, I switched up a little bit. I'm, I still really anal about diet. Yeah. Well, your life will be better for it in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, it's uh, it's you know, you look at COVID and all that. I mean, what's the kind of underlying theme? Oh, uh, your vitamin D levels are low. You're insulin resistant or morbidly Obesity. obese. Yeah, yeah, those are those are things you can control. Where can uh, where can people find you? Uh, I guess I got an Instagram. Is You're that... not on it much though, which is good. No, I just go on to watch my uh, like my daughter surfs a lot. Yeah, you follow people because you're more interested in yeah. what they have going on than people actually following you. Actually, yeah, I'm more excited to watch uh, like the stuff because she rips yeah. surfing and it's fun to watch her surf and post and stuff and you know she and she does stuff for like wetsuit sponsor or yeah you know the the board she's riding and it's it's cool to watch that but uh yeah it's a touche mosh it you know on Instagram. Uh, how about your? I mean, is the company you have with JT not the one you're working at now? But do you guys still have that in existence? No, we we just like Cut, shut it down. Yeah, okay. shut it down because we're we're so emotionally invested uh, in yeah, in sense. our store in Scilabs that uh, I want that needs to be 100 percent of our focus. I can I can completely and, uh, see that. But yeah, no, I'm on Instagram. I check it. Yeah, you know, of- once a fortnight. No, I get on it now. <laughs> I mean, I'll check it every day just to see what's going on. The uh, you know, there's uh. Yeah, I, I get on that every day. All right. I got it. Yeah. Closing thoughts by Jason Tushin. We've been at it for almost three hours. Have you really? Yeah. That's probably why I'm feet are tap dancing. I got to take a leak. Uh, that's always a good time to end it. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, polish that down. Like, oh, that's digested. Oh, you guzzled that in like the first 15. I did. That's, <laughs> I got that from my dad. Yeah, rookie <laughs> move. You're just like, boom, fifth gear, and then you boom. I know, my dad, I grew up watching my dad. Like, it'd be like eight o'clock, and I'll have a cup of coffee. At night? Uh, yeah, and he'll go, he'll sleep. It doesn't. How do you do that? Uh, it's, I know the answer. It's called a burned out adrenal gland. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a metabolism that's uh, pretty high. And a burned uh, out adrenal gland. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. Love money, trust few. Always paddle your own canoe. No, that's kind of weird. I'd be a good that's face a, tattoo as well. That's an SBS. Uh, Is it? it? Yeah, we, you know, like they used to come over to work at the command. And yeah. They had a, it was a glass of Guinness. Some dude with his dive crap on diving into it. Love many, trust few. Always paddle your own canoe. <sighs> it's good. I like it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be new for it to be. Uh... What's old is new again, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, man. Ready Appreciate to uh, ready to hit the mountain tomorrow? Yeah, it'd be cool. It's going to be a pretty good day, I believe. Nice. Yeah. Uh, it's probably raining outside, but I believe the mountain will get somewhere between 8 to 12 inches. Cool. That's like, uh, yeah, I'm missing the surf right now. A little bit in San Diego, so it'll be fun to do some uh, frozen frozen water. It feels different when you fall. Oh, yeah. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, I used to ski a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool, man. In the west bank of the river. That's a farm, west bank. It gives me hell. Still give it to me in the grove. Okay, one's in from the north. I've got the west bank of the river. Two's going to give it to you in the grove. Roger, give me that gun run. Wait a long out back, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com and there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab, and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you could tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.